Uh, that music has me fired up. Let's get after it here on what could be a very busy day for the markets. The Consumer Price Index, uh, among three things we're watching here this morning, but the Consumer Price Index came in at a headline increase of 8.2% year over year. Core prices uh, rose six tenths of a percent, similar to the gain in August. And most importantly, outside of the optics of these uh, hotter than expected numbers, uh, guys, is you, you still don't get the sense that inflation is slowing. And uh, a good shout out or a good call out by Peter Bookvar over at Bleakley, uh, an immediate reaction to these numbers, calling out that the peak Fed funds rate for uh, April of next year now bumping up against 5%. So the immediate read here, why you're seeing stock futures down, the immediate read here is perhaps the Fed is going to have to stay more aggressive on raising interest rates perhaps a little bit longer than many people on Wall Street expected. I mean, really, this just seems to be a confirmation of the 75 basis points that the market was also already mostly pricing in for the next meeting. I want to dig into this a little bit uh, and look at where the inflation was coming from, because I think it's important, Brad. It wasn't coming from energy. We know that, right? We saw a drop in energy prices overall of 2.1 percent. However, there is one outlier there, and that is utility gas service up 2.9 percent. Natural gas prices have been going higher here. We've also seen an increase in overall energy services as a result of that. Another place that we saw an increase, transportation services and medical care services, as well as food seeing an increase. So all of these so-called transitory things, we are still seeing some increases in those. Yeah, shelter, food, and medical care expenses or indexes, those were the largest of many contributors to the monthly seasonally adjusted all items increase here. And for particularly where we've been looking at some of these increases across the board and really even comparing that with some of the data that had come out earlier this week, uh, whether that be on PPI or whether that be on one of the data points I had cited yesterday within the digital price index where consumers are shopping online, it is an increase still in prices of the necessities, groceries, apparel, and then on the other discretionary items that people, companies rather, are just trying to churn through and people are looking at a heavy promotional cycle, that's where you're seeing some of those decreases start to trickle through more largely in electronics and things of that nature. But again, this really spells out what is still very present in front of us and pressing in terms of the necessities still being at elevated levels and continuing to nudge up. And so that's gonna be the larger question of when we actually start to see the deceleration, not just the deceleration, but also the declines that the Fed is looking for too. Let's continue. Yeah, a couple this. things for me. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. The, I was just going to say the the, the ten year uh, highest at, uh, since two thousand eight. The ten year yield very important. Look, we talked to PepsiCo CFO Hugh Johnson yesterday. Uh, he said he's raising prices in the fourth quarter. Again, they rose prices, raised prices third quarter, did it in the second quarter, did it in the first quarter. Not getting any sign from corporate America that they're going to suddenly pull back on price increases because the Fed is out there raising rates. I also know too, November 2nd Fed meeting now is looking a lot more hawkish, not good for the markets. Today's CPI print came in hotter than expected at 8.2%, but our senior columnist Rick Newman has found some bright spots in today's report. Rick, we have been asking so many guests over the last two hours to give us some good news. No one's been able to do it. So tell us what you think is good in this report. Well, you have to squint a little bit, but I've been paying a lot of attention to what's happening in transportation. And if you look at what has happened with uh, the inflation rate for new cars and especially for used cars, uh, the, the inflation rate is actually coming down. Uh, remember when uh, the price of used cars at the beginning of the year, the annual inflation rate was like 45 percent for used cars. And we were all like, how did that happen? Well, we know now. Uh, that that the price of used cars was surging by so much because there weren't enough new cars. Um, there has been, there has been a persistent shortage of new cars available, and that has a lot to do with the semiconductor shortage. Uh, those that shortage is still there, but it's getting worked out. And we have seen uh, the inflation rate for used cars come down from around 45 percent at an annualized rate earlier this year. The annual rate now is around 7.5 percent. I think that's still too high, but at least that situation is getting better. And of course, gasoline inflation has been improving, but it seems like we've seen uh, the end of the gas price decline and it's probably gonna stabilize around $3.90. The rest of the report, there are a lot of things going wrong and uh, we are not getting the break in uh, inflation that a lot of people have been hoping for. Yeah, how big a concern is this for President Biden? Said today, the report shows some progress against his fight against higher prices. 
perhaps you explain what that progress is, but how big an issue is this for Democrats? Remember just a couple of months ago, Democrats in Congress passed an energy bill that they named the Inflation Reduction Act. I think one of the reasons that they gave it that actually silly name uh, is that when inflation does come down, inevitably it will, uh, they'll be able to say, see, we did that because we passed this thing called the Inflation Reduction Act. It worked. It was like magic. Uh, without a doubt, they hoped they would be able to say that by the time of the midterm elections, uh, which are now less than a month away in, on November 8th, and they can't. They, they cannot say uh, that we have meaningfully brought inflation down um, I mean, it's down about a little more than a percentage point from the high point it was at over uh, over the summer. But in inflation at 8.2 percent, nobody is going to declare victory on that. I guess the one thing Democrats can hope for is that um, the big decline in gas prices has made people feel a little bit better. That has corresponded with uh, a minor uptick in consumer confidence and a similar small uptick in President Biden's approval rating. But it hasn't gone high enough. Um, Biden's approval is around 43 or 44 percent. I think for Democrats to have a good shot at holding on to uh, both houses of Congress, Biden's approval would have to be around 50 percent, even higher. Uh, and he just is not going to get there by November 8th. So um, this is the last uh, inflation report we're going to get before the midterm elections. We are going to have one more employment report and we're going to have one more Federal Reserve meeting. But uh, everybody now seems to think the Fed is um, is certain to raise by another three quarters of a point, another big hike coming. So um, if inflation comes down, it's going to have to come after the midterms. Yeah, he's going to need gas prices to stay with a three in front of it as well. Rick Newman, good to see you, sir. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, let's keep tracking the markets here this morning. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq Composite all deeply in the red here. This after a hotter than expected as you're seeing CPI print. And we've seen this decline initiated exactly in time with when that CPI report dropped. For more on today's activity, let's get on over to Jared Blickery at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Jared, what are you seeing in the tape thus far? Ouch. Uh, that's what I'm saying today. Let's take a look at the Nasdaq. That's down the most here over two and a quarter percent over the last four days. So this week it's down another four percent. Let's check out the last seven days because we had some downdrafts last week down another nine percent. When we look inside the market, only energy has been in the green uh, crude oil actually under a little bit of water here. And we'll talk about that in a second. But consumer discretionary just taking it on the chin and down another two point seven five percent, followed by tech and then real estate. Let's take a look inside Inside the Nasdaq here, we got Amazon down four and a half percent. I believe it's just about to test its lows of the years. Here's a year to date chart. You can see indeed here we go trying to see if we can uh, bounce from there. But too late or too early to see if that's going to happen just yet. Tesla hitting another one year low. It has now taken out these May, June, July rounded bottom lows here. So that is down 40 percent this week. And if you want to know the culprit, you got to take a look at the U.S. dollar. I'm going to show you uh, one of our screens here. This is our heat map of the U.S. dollar versus everything else. The pound, uh, very interesting seeing what's going on there. Also the Japanese yen. By the way, the pound, the Bank of England may be scrapping those tax cuts in favor of, guess what, tax hikes in a month. But that U.S. dollar very much weighing on equity markets here. Also want to get a quick check of crude oil as a lot of criticism heaped on OPEC plus, including the International Energy Agency itself. Haven't seen that in a while. So lots going on here. Crude oil down four tenths of a percent, guys. We're keeping an eye on the oil and energy markets, especially after that hot CPI report showed that energy prices were up nearly 20 percent in September compared to a year ago. Our very own Ines Ferret is here with a closer look. Ines, what are you seeing? Well, Rochelle, watching oil prices today, we did see a bump in those. You're looking at WTI that's up more than 2%, settling at $89.11 per barrel. Meanwhile, Brent crude settled at $94.50 per barrel, up 2%. Earlier this week, oil prices had been lower over concerns of further rate hikes. Also, energy prices increased 19.8% in September off of that CPI print that you just talked about. Uh, that's compared to a year ago, month over month, energy prices prices declined by 2.1%. And just looking at those components, you had the gasoline index, which fell, but the natural gas and electricity indices, those rose. Michelle? Yahoo Finances, Ines Ferre, thank you for that update. All right, we're just a couple of minutes from the closing bell. Let's bring in Jared Blickery to break down the 
glowing market action because, of course, we rally on bad inflation prints. That's what we do, man. That is that is correct. But I'll tell you what, this is actually uh, good news. Actually, bad news is good news. We're yes. going to figure that out. All right. I want to show you the NASDAQ here. That is up over two and one third percent. But you really get a feel for what happened today if you look at the futures. This is the S&P 500. Just want to show you that was that dip on CB, CPI. And this is what a recovering rally looks like. Now, if you take a year to date look on the candlesticks, I just want to show you this huge green candle down here. You can see it even better on this three month chart. Wow, that is a reversal. I went back in history. The last time uh, we got a new 52 week low and a big upside reversal closing up two percent or more bunches of these caught the bottom in a, in a bunch of bear markets. So I'm going to be writing this up for tomorrow. You guys watch out for it. In the meantime, I want to leave you with a few heat maps here. Here's the sector action for today. Those value stacks up more than 4%. Energy and financials. Tech also up more than 3%. And materials right there with them. Those are all the outperformers. I'm just going to show you what the NASDAQ 100 looks like on a good up day. There you go. Apple up 3%. So is Microsoft. Tesla up 2%, guys. Here's a closing bell on Wall Street. There is your closing bell on this hump day. Stocks ending the day on a downward note. Not a whole lot of action, as you can see. The Dow down just 28 points. The S&P down about 12, and the Nasdaq barely slipping to the downside, nine points. Not a whole lot of reaction to the Fed minutes for a closer look at the broader markets. Let's bring in Eric Friedman, U.S. Bank Asset Management CIO, and Hugh Roberts, Quant Insight Head of Analytics. Good to see you both. Uh, Eric, let's start with you. Any takeaway from the Fed minutes, or do you expect tighter, longer, nothing's really changed in the dynamics here? Yeah, I think it's a it's a story that we've heard from the Fed really most specifically post Jackson Hole, which is rates higher and higher for longer. I think that was really the the, the key message coming out of uh, this this set of minutes. I think the key thing for us, as we think about the, the really the tail end of this year, is not so much what happens next meeting, but more what does it look like for the Fed in the first quarter of next year. By that point, we expect to have a little bit of guidance from companies, which should be a little more sobered. And, and perhaps a bit more tepid than, than what we may hear right now. So our viewpoint is the bar is pretty high for the Fed to come off its, its current rate path for this year. But if we get into the first quarter of next year with some downbeat company guidance, I think the Fed may start to waver at least a little bit. And Hugh, as you look at the Fed minutes and also some of these data points that you know that the Fed is watching and really looking for this sustained inflation to start going down, what is your outlook? Yeah, I would largely echo uh, Eric's comment first up. I think this year and the immediate you know, next couple of meetings are pretty much locked in. Uh, really, 2023 and the outlook there is more important. I guess if we're trying to um, look a wee bit further ahead, I think the comments um, from Deputy Chair Brainard have been probably the most interesting uh, because the... The, the messaging has been consistent. It's been about tightening financial conditions. That's been true all year. And, and as Eric said, it went up a gear after Jackson Hole. Raynard appears to be the one who is just flagging the fact that uh, overseas markets are seeing stress. Uh, we've seen, obviously, intervention in dollar-yen. Uh, we're all aware of the shenanigans going on here in the UK after the mini-budget a few weeks back. Uh, I know the whole kind of move fast and break things. I think in the States, you're used to looking at um, things like inverted yield curves or credit spreads as the things that might domestically be the things that break. But actually, it's looking like it's international stuff that's breaking first. Uh, and Brainard seems to be flagging that up a little bit. So very early days yet. It's not obvious she's got a consensus at all. But she's the one potential outlier um, as things currently stand. Eric, what do you think this means just in terms of uh, the pricing activity that we're going to see between now and year end? Are we going to remain volatile or is more of the, that risk to the downside, do you think, from these levels? We think probably a little more risk to the downside. And I, I would just tip my cap to Hugh and, and their firm. They do great work on this topic uh, specifically. But just in terms of our read on things, we say really a couple of things at work. Number one is that we think we're largely in sync with the Fed's most recent um, uh, thoughts regarding the forward the state of the curve. In other words, we think the, the market is really in tune with what the Fed is thinking with respect to interest rate hikes. That's really the first repricing that we've had. You cover this as a team very well in the last segment. And we think what's next 
is the slowdown, almost the, the lagged impacts of higher rates, still uh, elevated fuel costs, still elevated shelter costs. We think that's going to start to really weigh in on margins. And so we do think there's probably a little more downside. We wouldn't be abandoning ships, if you will, right now. But we do think that in terms of risk to the equity market, we'd still be leaning a bit more defensive. As you pointed out, utilities and infrastructure, those have been areas that we've actually been been fairly constructive on. They've, they've been, we think, un, unduly hit in, in recent days. Those are getting more attractive. We'd stick around in energy as well. Those would be our top ideas right now. Hugh, you say the latest uh, down move has not been a function of macro fundamentals. What are you seeing? Well, it, it's more the fact that we're, we're being uber tactical here, uh, to be fair. So, you know, the the primary trend throughout 2022 has been that macro conditions for U.S. equity markets have got worse. And that's largely a function of what we talked about just now, i.e. tighter financial conditions, and in particular, the move in real yields and the move in credit spreads. Uh, what's interesting from a very short term perspective is that this latest downtrade, and I'm talking in the last week now, um, our model value has actually flatlined so that this very latest down move has been less justified by macro fundamentals than for much of the bear market price action of the last nine, 10 months. So if you are in a kind of repeat of the summer potential for a bear market squeeze, looking at positioning, looking at beating up sentiment. I saw an interesting tweet today about um, insider buying, picking up. Um, it tends to get people interested when, you know, uh, CEOs are buying their own stocks. Um, if, you, if you're thinking there's scope for a bit of a tactical squeeze within the context of the primary bear market, then what we're seeing at the moment actually is that um, S&P is around 6% cheap to our model value because macro conditions have kind of stabilized at, at the lows and this latest sell-off has gone a little bit further. So still agree with the, the primary bearish uh, dynamic that, that's been espoused, but there may be some hope for a little bit of a bear market squeeze. And Eric, the, some of the clients that you speak to, what lens are you, are you suggesting that they really view this period through? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that, you know, uh, for those that have capital that, that they need in the, let's call it the next three to six months, uh, we think that, look, a great place to be is in very short duration fixed income. But for a long time, we just haven't been paid Rochelle to be involved whatsoever in that part of the, in that part of the curve. Not to say that there isn't some potential price risk, but just as you hit in the earlier segment, if you're looking at corporate bonds that are spitting out five, five and a half, six percent yields, not a bad spot to be in very, very short maturities. I do think for, that for those clients that have the ability to, to kind of piece into stuff, we would not be aggressively involved in technology consumer discretionary right now. We do think that the supply demand imbalance is still skewed the wrong way for technology in the immediate term. But again, we do think that there's likely to be some rationalization towards the middle to the second half of next year for, again, for longer term investors. So our viewpoint has been, look, take what you're given in this market. Don't don't trade the market that you want, trade the market that you have. And, and so grabbing some yield up front makes sense. We do think that there's a time to, again, reconcile the, the second half of next year. We're just not there quite yet. And Hugh, one of the challenges in this market now is a strong dollar. That, of course, is being felt on a global scale. We did get the earnings out from Pepsi this morning that were actually better than expected. Some were wondering whether or not, I guess, how big of a threat that strong dollar would be to a name like Pepsi. What do you think today's results really tell us just about what we can expect this earnings season? Well, from a macro perspective, I think the Pepsi earnings were bad news uh, from the Fed's policymaking perspective because it basically showed that uh, they have pricing power and that they're going to increase margins. Um, and that's not good for the Fed, who want to see uh, demand slow down, obviously. Um, more broadly, yeah, I agree totally that um, the strength of the dollar is going to be a key, key issue um, for this particular earnings season. On our analysis, we have the ability to break down uh, patterns between, say, sectors and the strength of the dollar. Uh, and it's the independent pattern where we can help, uh, we're able to strip out the isolated impact of the dollar uh, on different assets. And what stands out on our analysis at the moment is that if you look at the likes of energy, either XLE, OIH, XOP, they're all comparatively uh, uh, indifferent to the dollar. It's not really a big driver of price action in the energy ETFs at the moment. 
but it's technology that is most vulnerable. And that's true for XLK. Um, it is true for something like consumer discretionary, where, of course, um, Amazon and Tesla, I think, are nearly 50 percent uh, of that sector. And it's especially true for something like SOX, the semiconductor ETF. So I think that's probably where, on our analysis, that's where potentially the most pain is going to be felt. I mentioned the minutes from the Fed meeting. That's a big driver here in this afternoon's trading. Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomberger has the latest on that. Hey, Jen. Good afternoon, Shauna. Many Fed officials felt that the cost of doing too little to cool inflation versus the cost of doing to outweighed the cost of doing too much, according to internal policy deliberations amongst Fed officials at their meeting three weeks ago. Now, several participants felt the need to maintain a restrictive stance for as long as necessary, with a couple stressing that historical experience showed the danger of prematurely ending periods of tight monetary policy. Now, at the time, Fed officials remain, thought that inflation remained unacceptably high, noting that inflation data had come in above expectations and was declining more slowly than anticipated. Several participants pointed to continued elevated rates of the increase in core goods prices, that is, prices excluding those volatile food and energy prices. Now, most Fed officials feel that some interest rate sensitive sectors like housing and business fixed investment have started to respond to rate hikes, but that a large portion of sectors in the economy have yet to. Now, as monetary policy tightens further, officials think that they can slow the pace of rate hikes at some point and assess the impact of those rate hikes that have already been implemented on inflation. Many officials felt that once the policy rate had reached a sufficiently restrictive level, they would maintain that level for, quote, some time until there was, quote, compelling evidence that inflation was on course to return to that 2 percent objective. Now, many officials expect the economy to uh, grow at a pace below trend this year and for the next couple of years as uh, they expect these interest rate hikes to filter through the economy, guys. All right. Thanks for that update. Jen Schoenberger reporting there. Of course, if we didn't have if we didn't have enough to worry about, we're on the cusp of the earnings season. Banks are set to report. And as Wall Street gears up for all these earnings reports, we've got inflation and Fed rate hikes to watch as well. There you're looking at the CPI expectations, which is coming out tomorrow morning. Here to help make sense of all of this, J.P. Morgan Asset Management's global market strategist, Jordan Jackson. Jordan, thanks for being here. So obviously we've got a lot to contend with. And I didn't even mention currencies in that mix, which our Jared Blickery was just laying out, has been a real headwind for the market. The dollar strength that we have seen, what central banks around the world are doing. I actually want to start there briefly, just talk about the headwind that currencies are presenting and how much that is factoring into your investment equations right now. Sure. Uh, if you think about the, the currency and the impact to uh, revenues, um, you know, roughly 40 percent of S&P 500 revenues are generated overseas. Uh, so as we sort of think about the strength of the dollar overseas, as well as the weakening economic backdrop, particularly in places like China and Europe, uh, a lot of these multinational earnings could very well be coming under pressure uh, through, through the third quarter. Um, but currency markets, I think, are very much sniffing out uh, this, this weak sort of global backdrop and this challenging environment that global central banks find themselves in, particularly with the Bank of England and, and, and the, uh, the Bank of Japan. On one end, uh, particularly in the Bank of England, they're hiking interest rates uh, to try to, to a certain extent, stabilize their currency, uh, while they're also, they just finishing out uh, buying bonds by the end of this week to try to uh, stabilize the bond, bond market. Very, very difficult environment for, for global central banks to try and, and navigate. And so uh, this is certainly another layer of uncertainty and, and, and complication uh, in the markets. And um, I do think this means that the dollar is probably going to remain pretty strong through the end of the year and, and into next year. As Julie mentioned at the top, we're going to be kicking off this earnings season. Some of the banks, we're set to hear from them. Uh, and with that in mind, a lot of chatter around how strong the household balance sheet is. From your perspective and, and what you've been reading through, where are household balance sheets and especially going into next year, what is that kind of tenor of the consumer likely to be? 
I still think uh, household balance sheets are, are in decent shape. Um, I, I will acknowledge that uh, we do anticipate uh, another quarter of, of a buildup in loan loss provisions uh, across across banks. This would be the sixth consecutive quarter uh, that banks have decided to, uh, to to build up those loan loss reserves, and that is certainly going to act as a drag on overall bank earnings. And I think it's very much uh, them being taking a slightly more conservative approach, just recognizing that. You know, just about every analyst and market participant is calling for a recession sometime in 2023. And so I think banks really just want to fortify their balance sheets uh, ahead of that. Uh, but when we look at the data today, we certainly acknowledge that uh, consumers have been dipping into those pandemic-related savings. They've also been uh, uh, running up some of their credit card balances. But I would argue this is more of a normalization in credit card spending and usage, not necessarily a consumer that's becoming overextended. If you actually look at revolving credit as a percentage of disposable income leading up into the pandemic, that number was sitting at around six and a half percent. Uh, and now after uh, consumers decided to pay down some of those credit card balances over the course of the pandemic, that number has picked back up to around a 6% level. So uh, we and, and uh, to add to that, we haven't necessarily seen consumer delinquency rates uh, pick back up meaningfully. So you know, I think today consumers are still in a decent shape. Labor markets are still tight. Nominal wages are still strong. Uh, and that could certainly provide a, uh, some support for consumers over the short term. Uh, but again, as businesses become a little bit more sour about the economic outlook, you'll start to see those hiring freezes start to lead into job cuts and job uh, and layoffs, uh, and then that's when the consumer is really going to start to come under pressure. Jordan, is the reality that the bear market is just not going to end until there is any whiff of a Fed pivot? To a certain extent, I think I think that's fair. Um, and, and the reason why the pivot is so important is because uh, there's still room, right, for the Fed to actually be more hawkish. Um, I know you've got the Fed that's signaling a roughly 4.6% terminal rate next year, but I think the real question is, when is the federal funds rate going to cross CPI? And I think it's going to cross sometime at the middle of next year. The challenge is I think it crosses at a higher Fed funds rate, not a lower inflation rate. Um, and so I think they're, the, the Fed, and we'll get minutes sometime this afternoon, um, I think it's certainly going to uh, continue to show that while some committee members are concerned about a, a slowdown in the economy, they're still laser focused on trying to bring down inflation and more importantly, maintaining that in their credibility as an inflation fighting entity. Um, and so I, I think you, you do kind of have to see that Fed pivot because markets don't like higher rates uh, and the Fed may actually be in a position to do a little bit more uh, over the course of the first half of next year. Consumers are making some tough decisions on spending habits during record inflation. Now, a new report from the National Research Group revealing some of the most surprising choices here. Over 40 percent of consumers saying that they have cut back on restaurant dining and also groceries over the past six months. But get this, that 18 percent there, only 18 percent are saying where, where consumers are or that they are cutting back on streaming. When you take a look at some of the satisfaction numbers, Dave, within this survey, 94% saying that they are very satisfied with the money that they're spending on TV and streaming. 95% saying that they're satisfied with what they're spending on Amazon Prime. Only 72% saying that they're satisfied with what they're spending on dating apps. So those that are cutting some of their subscription services, the first to go are the dating apps. Now makes that sense. makes sense to me. I mm -hmm. am shocked that streaming wasn't higher on this list. Quite frankly, with times are tough yeah. the last year or two, it's been one of the first conversations we've had yeah. at home about why do we have so many streaming services when we watch so little television? I expected most Americans were starting to evaluate their streaming platforms because the prices continue to go up. You have so many options and there's not a lot of content that is really that sticky. So that was a real surprise to me. And Rochelle, what else shocked me is seven. 17.8% of household budgets is spent on subscription services. Now that doesn't just mean streaming, that does mean um, like Amazon and Walmart Plus products and services, but that is an enormous number. We are now committing to some type of subscription service. Another surprise from this study. No, I would agree. And I, I think maybe what part of the reason why people aren't willing to give those up, it's, it's steady. You know exactly what the price is going to be every month. Whereas, as we've seen with food inflation, you don't know what your groceries are going to cost. When you go out to a restaurant, you don't know what the prices are going to be, how much you're going to have to tip. So those prices are really going up. So it's, it's a lot harder to judge how much it's going to be every time you come out. Whereas, at least with streaming, you have some consistency there. You can consistently budget for that every month. 
I'm not giving up my groceries and eating out, but it depends on what your priorities are in life. I would gladly cut out some streaming if it came to food, but that but that is just me, Shona. What would you be most same. willing to give up on this list? Real quick, I just wanted to add, what we're seeing on the screen was a huge surprise to me. Brands consumers most associate with subscription services in terms of media, Amazon at number two, ahead of Hulu, Disney, and YouTube, where conversely, when they asked uh, consumers products and services subscriptions, guess what didn't make the top five? Amazon. Really? So in the eyes of the consumers, Ooh. Amazon is primarily media, not products and services, which is baffling to me. That's very surprising. There's an Amazon box on my doorstep just about every week. Yeah, I was going to say, I actually, me, every week, every <laughs> I actually day. associate it very differently. I do associate with Amazon with the products. I mostly use it. I'm on there every single day. I just placed two orders, actually, Same. this morning, rather than their prime video service. So that is an interesting twist here to this. Yeah, hmm. very surprising uh, findings in this study. All right, well, the International Monetary Fund issuing a gloomy global outlook for 2023, warning of slower growth and the risk of recession next year. Yahoo Finance's Jen Schoenberger sat down with the fund's director of monetary policy and capital markets. Jen, what did they tell you? Hey, good afternoon, Rochelle. That's right. The IMF downgrading its outlook for global growth and also warning that the risks to the stability of the global financial system have, quote, materially worsened and that markets are at risk of disorderly repricing. As you mentioned, I sat down with Tobias Adrian, the head of capital markets and monetary policy for the IMF, to discuss this and whether some of the turmoil that we've seen in Britain's bond market could be a precursor or elsewhere. Take a listen. We have certainly seen market illiquidity in many markets around the world, but uh, market dysfunction uh, we have only seen in the UK uh, in, in, in recent uh, weeks. Um, so what's happening there is that um, a new uh, fiscal plan was announced and uh, that has led to a very, very sharp rise in interest rates. Uh, and uh, the rise in interest rates has been uh, dysfunctional with adverse feedback loops uh, due to financial vulnerabilities in the non-bank financial sector. So that's what triggered the Bank of England to intervene in order to restore orderly market functioning. And uh, while uh, the rise in interest rates has co-moved to some degree uh, with other interest rates. That's something very normal. Interest rates tend to move together. We haven't seen a spillover in terms of market dysfunction. So you're not seeing any similar risks akin to what we're seeing playing out in the UK now that may be brewing in other markets around the world, to be clear. Well, there's certainly risks uh, that the situation could change. So. Um, what we've seen around the world in, in many countries is that interest rates have been increased tremendously. Um, in some countries, three, four, five percent. In other countries, even more than that. Most of that tightening has been done within orderly market conditions. So it has been an orderly tightening. And our baseline forecast is that this orderly tightening is going to continue. Having said that, there is certainly a risk of disorderly tightening at some point. There could be dysfunction more broadly outside of the UK as well. So Warren Buffett famously has said that when the tide runs out, we find out who has been skinny dipping. So as central banks around the world have been raising rates, what sorts of vulnerabilities has that revealed? Is this perhaps the point in time where uh, China's property market finally sees it, a potential for reckoning after experts have been calling for this for what, 15 years now? Does the US housing market have uh, farther to drop? Uh, what are some unforeseen vulnerabilities there that this is unmasking? So there are many vulnerabilities out there and we're flagging in the Global Financial Stability Report what kind of vulnerabilities could be acting up once negative shocks are hitting. Um, so we see leverage, we see maturity transformation and liquidity mismatches around the world, particularly in the non-bank financial sector. Um, and uh, when uh, further negative news was to occur uh, for a variety of reasons, 
that could indeed uncover those vulnerabilities. Switching gears slightly, in the report, uh, you notate the IMF's global bank stress test shows that in a scenario with an abrupt and sharp tightening of financial conditions, that would send the global economy into recession in 2023 amid high inflation. My question is, how close are we to that sort of scenario, given that financial conditions have already tightened quite a bit? Uh, would it be prudent for central banks and the Fed to perhaps hit the pause button here and take a step back, given that monetary policy operates with a lag and see how things progress before hiking further? Yeah, we are very comfortable with uh, the monetary policy that is currently envisioned by the Federal Reserve and that is priced into markets. Uh, we think that this is what is needed in order to get inflation down. Um, so to get inflation down, you need to slow economic activity to some degree. Hopefully, this will be a soft landing. <coughs> or even if it was to be a recession, uh, it could be a shallow recession, we hope. But of course, there are downside risks around that forecast. And we could see a more severe recession with uh, a relatively high likelihood. Well, there you have it. The IMF appears to be on the same page as the Federal Reserve when it comes to rate hikes and fighting inflation. Of course, whether that means a soft landing or a shallow recession remains to be seen. Guys. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me for this important program. Now, today, inflation is disrupting household finances as higher prices erode workers' recent wage gains and retirees' monthly budgets. Meanwhile, a volatile bear market is putting retirees' income-producing investments at risk. This event will connect the dots between inflation, financial resiliency, and retirement income security. Our guests today include Senator Roger Marshall of Kansas and some of the nation's brightest minds in retirement security. And we'll discuss how policy changes paired with new programs and financial industry innovation can help Americans establish financial security even amid the tumult. Now, I want to thank the Bipartisan Policy Centers Funding Our Future Coalition and the Alliance for Lifetime Income for sponsoring this terrific event with us. Now, the Funding Our Future is a cross-sector coalition working to secure a better retirement for all Americans by making retirement policy a top priority for lawmakers. You can find out more about their work at fundingourfuture.us. Now, the Alliance for Lifetime Income is a nonprofit organization created to educate Americans about the importance of having protected income in retirement. You can learn more and access their free financial planning tools at protectedincome.org. Well, now let's turn to my interview with Senator Marshall. We started by talking about how retirees are doing at the moment. Well, certainly the number one topic back home is the cost of groceries and gasoline, the, the cost of rent. So whether you're retired or a, a young married couple with two kids, um, that, that inflation is, is absolutely a social injustice that it hits them, impacts them more than anybody. And the challenge right now is this double whammy. Whatever the peak of your retirement account's value was, it's now about 20 to 25% less. And then on top of that, Inflation, you know, over two years is probably 13%, 8% of the past year, 5% the year before. So at the end of the day, you only have about 70% of your purchasing power. So you were counting on your, 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 uh, your nest egg to be this big and all of a sudden it's this big. So it's, it's a huge problem right now. And we know that there are, there are 20 million Americans who are actually nearing retirement, or those who perhaps, if they want to get an early start, obviously they've lived through different kinds of financial crises and they're seeing what some of their parents are perhaps are going through. Talk about the most significant changes that the Rise and Shine Act in the works in the Senate brings and what the Secure 2.0 um, Act adds to it as well. Right, so this uh, Rise and Shine Act in the Senate, what its goal was to, is to number one, is to give employees and employers more flexibility, more, more options, more transparency. And what I really liked about it is this rainy day fund. So I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan. My wife and I took that early on. We teach it at our church. I, mean, I don't teach it, but our friends teach the course. Uh, so setting up a rainy day fund. So this would allow some, uh, pro pro some uh, more flexibilities in setting up that rainy day fund of three to six months of cash. Uh, but, all, but it's all just um, 
spitting in the wind, if you'll forgive me, right now with inflation where it is and with uh, the, the stock market down so much, that it's just not going to do any good. We can't do it. We could do it. We try and try. We're putting fingers in the dikes, but the real problem is inflation and the stock market. So for people who are wondering about the provisions in the Rise and Shine Act, how would you describe how it impacts them? What can they expect? Well, you know, first of all, it's going nowhere. You know, this was not a, not a priority for this president uh, or the Senate. Uh, so it was turned into more of a messaging bill. It, its opportunities were to, to give more flexibility, and, and especially if your people are taking out uh, their funds as a as, as a, a one chunk of the retirement plan all at the same time, is to set some protections around that. I think people are probably leaving some money on the table when they take out a, a mass lump, and we were trying to protect the consumer, so, so to speak. So there were good things in it, but, I'm, but basically it had nothing to do uh, with carbon, so therefore it's not a priority for this president or, this, or Leader Schumer. So I want to talk about you obviously proposing this, this study when it comes to retirement savings there. What is it that you're hoping to achieve and what would you like people to really do with the results of the study as well? Right. So think about the reference time of the, when we were offering this amendment. So we're considering a bill about retirement and maybe six months ago. And even then, I was much more concerned about inflation than I was trying to set up these perfect retirement plans. So the purpose of that amendment was to point out to my colleagues that inflation was the true problem. So I was going to hopefully set up a proactive uh, study of how inflation would, it, would uh, affect retirement plans. But guess what? Now we can do a retrospective study. So the retrospective study is just is about everything we're talking about today. How 13% inflation, additive inflation over the two years, has impacted your purchasing power of the dollar and eventually how it impacted the value of your, stock, your stocks as, as well. So that was the purpose of it. But clearly this is something that you're very passionate about. How did you come to be so passionate about this? What were really the driving forces is behind you moving forward on this? Oh, you know, I, I think it was the right thing to do. Certainly, it was a bipartisan opportunity. I'm part of this, I'm a sandwich generation person, so I've got parents that are certainly retired, and at the same time, I've got kids with young families. So, you know, whenever we have opportunity to help, help people out to, to make their lives a little bit more comfortable, then we want to do it. Um, I think the transparency is always good, so I think that was a great part of the bill. Now, of course, once lawmakers, everyday Americans, employers are sort of wondering how all of this plays out for them. If you're an employer and you're, and you're seeing some of these provisions coming to pass, what messages do you have for them about what they can expect? Are you saying if, if this would pass? Yes. If, okay, so first of all, it's going nowhere. Uh, it's, it's, dead, it's dead at this point in time. We're running out of days to pass it. It was not a priority uh, for the Democrat Party. But if it would have passed, I think it would have given employers more opportunities, more, uh, more options, if you will. And you certainly, I'm not a financial expert, so I think these, if you're a small business or a big business, you would use your HR people to say, how can we design a better retirement plan? But what I was really excited about was this rainy day fund, is how could you help your employees set up this rainy day fund? Because we all do have a rainy day at some point in time. Maybe it's you lose your air, your air conditioner, maybe a hurricane hits and you lose uh, all, your, all your, uh, your, your range, your, your washer and your dryer. And so as you look at some of the other provisions of Secure 2.0, what really stands out to you as what could be potential game changers for Americans who are looking at the cost of living, who are looking at retirement? Yeah. Well, you know, unfortunately, with 13% inflation over the last two years, there's just not much in there that could be a game changer. That's the real problem here. The real problem is inflation and the stock market tanking because of horrible policies coming out of the White House. Policies that, that drive up the cost of energy, policies that drive up the price of groceries, and policies that drive up the cost of housing. So th this would have been a small piece of the puzzle. It, it could have helped people. Uh, but right now, uh, the, the problem is inflation. The, then the problem is just the, the lack of financial security people have. So is there any hope in terms of perhaps harmonizing what we see in Secure 2.0, Rise and Shine, and um, in, ter like in terms of um, seeing how those might at some point get harmonized or some point see some movement? I know it's difficult in a midterm election year as we do get so close to oh. it. Yeah. Any, any sort of optimism that you see as a path forward, perhaps, with retirement savings? Well, I, I wish there was, uh, but, but I can just, just be pretty frank here and, and tell you that there's just not a conversation right now. Right now, we're just trying to keep the government open. We're living from crisis to crisis. 
And what the, the big concern is, the White House is not reversing any of its policies. That's why I said since you know over a year and a half ago, inflation is not transitory. It's going to continue to get worse. And if you were able to wave your political wand, what would be your top five priorities that you would want the administration to focus on that would be the most beneficial to retirees? Yeah, you know, I, I think number one, of, of course, is inflation. So the drivers of inflation, like I said before, are energy, food, and, and housing. So what policies could, could, could decrease the cost of energy? Well, that would be given more flexibility to American energy companies to set American energy free. When it comes to the cost of groceries, this president has declared a war not only on American energy, but also on American agriculture, which is driving up the price of food production. When it comes to the price of housing, the supply disruption has been created by this president paying people more to stay at home than to go back to work. So we need policies that would get people to go back to work rather than to stay home. So that's where I would start. I mean, it is tough because obviously for a lot of people, their nest egg is in their home. But as we've seen house prices go up, it means people want to sort of hold on to their equity and not move. And that's really not also helping with the housing crisis. In terms of the cost of living then, do you have any expectations then as you look at what's happening with inflation and some of the stickier parts that perhaps there will be some relief that we will see inflation start to temper down anytime soon? No, not at all. I, I mean, again, the, is, the president is doubling down on his policies that have cost inflation. And we have a president that don't even recognize that there's inflation. Look, inflation, the cost of living is up 8% compared to a year ago, which is up 5% compared to the year ago before that. And you have a president who's saying inflation is up just about an inch. We have a president who says that the price, the, the, the stock market value has no relevance to, American, to Americans, American retirees as well. So unless, the, unless there's a huge change up here, inflation is going to continue. And we're really getting this double whammy of quantitative tightening uh, al along with these regulatory policies that are driving up the cost of living. So then obviously then, if you're saying this is, this is dead in the water in terms of the policies for, for what we're seeing with retirement savings, what advice would you have for people then who essentially, at least for now, will have to take their retirement planning into their own hands? Um, get out and vote in November to change the policies uh, of, the, of the White House, which is killing the value of your retirement plan and that's driving up in, inflation. Look, in, uh, elections do have consequences. Um, and, and certainly, you know, what advice would I give, give my parents? Don't make any big changes. Uh, don't try to get rich quick. Go take a Dave Ramsey course. Uh, it, use a trusted financial advisor. I'm a physician. Uh, you would want to come to me to get advice on uh, if you, I'm an OBGYN, if you had breast cancer, ovarian cancer, you'd want to come to me and get advice about that. Uh, your retirement plan uh, is your nest egg. Your home and that retirement account are, are probably your greatest assets. So find a trusted person that you, could, that you have a long-term relationship with uh, that's not this get-rich-quick scheme uh, and, and make a plan for, for you uh, for the, and enjoy your time. Enjoy your time with your family. Focus on things that matter. The spending time with your family, doing things that you enjoy. And it's not always money doesn't buy the happiness. Doing fun things shouldn't necessarily be the most expensive things to do. We, should, we certainly hope not. A big thank you, Senator Marshall, for joining me this afternoon on Yahoo. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jason Fickner, Vice President and Chief Economist at the Bipartisan Policy Center. For more on the retirement policy landscape, we're now joined by Andrew Biggs, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and Teresa Giladucci, a labor economist focusing on retirement security at the New School. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. So I want to get great. I want to get started right away because we have limited time. There's a popular narrative now that we have basically a tale of two retirements: one for the haves and one for the have-nots. And while that narrative is framed along income and wealth, another way of viewing the narrative is generational, where the baby boom generation had access to defined benefit pension plans with income paid out in retirement for life, while the younger millennial and Gen Z generations have a defined contribution plan, which may or may not come with an employer match, and there's questions surrounding access. What are your thoughts? Do we have a tale of two retirements? And Teresa, I'll let you go first, please. Yeah, um, we definitely have a tale of two retirements, Jason, but it really has nothing much to do with the DB or 401k um, distinction. 
The DB pensions really hadn't covered everyone. Um, they were best when unions negotiated them, uh, but since unions have been crushed in the last 30 years, um, the DB benefit system really only lives in the private sector. Uh, we have a tale of two retirements in the 401k, do-it-yourself, voluntary, commercial, individual directed space. Um, take two people. They could be millennials or Gen Z people. Um, one will have jobs like Andrew and me, um, and others will have jobs like my cousin who went into, went into construction at 18, or my other cousin who went into personal training um, after college um, at about 25. Um, the person like Andrew and me who've had a stable life, um, a stable work, uh, we've been covered by 401k type um, plans all of our lives. We'll work 40 years or more. We've had no time out of the labor market. We haven't been unemployed. Um, and we've continually saved, you know, eight to 15% of pay. And um, yeah. crucially, you know, we have gotten raises. Um, so paying, you know, saving our raise and saving a little bit more was fine. And we'll do just fine in the DC world. Um, they're especially um, fine because we got federal um, and state um, um, subsidies in the form of, of um, sheltering our taxes that we, that when we contributed to those plans. And you know, 70% of those tax expenditures go to the top 20%. So we'll be okay. But my cousins um, have had divorces. They have jobs that force them out way before they were ready to. They had intermittent employment. They had intermittent savings accounts. They had conservative investment portfolios. They never had the benefit of, of a professional manager um, and they won't be okay. And they probably paid penalties to take money out during their work lives rather than get the kind of cushy subsidies that we gave. So that's about as um, different as a projection of retirement and it all comes from our American system. And, and I have some follow-up. I wanna hear your thoughts first and I'll ask some follow-up questions for you both. Sure. Well, I, I thought Teresa laid out a lot of interesting, useful stuff. I, I think in a sense, we have a kind of a tale of three cities. I don't want to complicate it. But, you know, the, the, the first one would be the traditional defined benefit system. And that worked well for some people. First, you had to have a defined benefit plan. And, you know, most people never did. And you also need to stay with the same employer for your whole career. If you did that, it was great. Then we shifted into the, the early 401k plans. And those had advantages in the sense you could take them from job to job if you were switching jobs. They were also much more common. It was employers are much more willing to offer a 401k uh, than they were a traditional pension. But they had downsides. The fees were too high. A lot of people failed to sign up for the plans. Uh, the investments were often confusing. And there, there weren't really very many options for converting that lump sum of money into income and retirement. Today, I think we're shifting into sort of our, our third retirement city where the defined contribution plans, the 401ks, are adopting some of the things that made uh, traditional pensions work going towards automatic enrollments. We don't have to choose whether to participate, we simply sign people up. That's that's a step in the right direction. Shifting from sort of a do-it-yourself investment uh, portfolio to what's called target date or life cycle funds, where the, you're, you're automatically shifted from stocks to bonds as you get older. That's been very, very helpful for people. Fees on these funds have dropped considerably as you more competition as we shifted out of active investments. The next step, I think, is how do we convert those lump sums? And people really do have quite a bit of retirement savings today. How do we convert that into an income that'll last you for life, similar to what pensions had? So I think the, 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 the progression of retirement savings in the U.S. has been kind of messy because everything in the U.S. is messy. Um, but I think ultimately we're going in the right direction. Retirement savings are up. Participation in these plans is up. Retirement incomes are up. So I think we are going in the right direction. So, Teresa, let me follow up with a question on this because what, what Andrew lays out seems to make historical sense when you look at the landscape of what's been happening pre, you know, historically and where we are today and how we're moving forward with the retirement landscape with defined contribution plans, ex adopting these DB-like systems. You pointed out sort of the loss of union wages and union power, but I don't think the DB system's coming back. And you mentioned your, your cousin who has different jobs and moves around. As Andrew mentioned, the DB system was designed for one job and you basically got incremental benefits the longer you stayed, which doesn't help those who have intermittent jobs or move around. 
With the DC plan now, we're trying to make that wealth accumulate and then maybe have some sort of payout structure, but you have to then have wealth at retirement in order to have a good payout. So if we're going to that defined, that DC world that has some DB payouts, how do we help those who have the intermittent jobs or the gig workers? What can we do to help them if that's the world we're going into? Right, um, yeah, let's not debate DB versus DC. <laughs> um, it does turn out that people who've had a little bit of DB coverage all their lives, they turn out to actually be a lot better than people who had DC coverage all their lives but that's over. Um, what can we do now forward to help um, people like my cousin? Um, well, it might be a little too late for my cousin, um, but we need to make sure that people start accumulating uh, retirement savings from the very beginning. Um, voluntary incentives um, haven't worked. With voluntary plans, you get half of the people in a plan and that really kind of is stuck. And you can see that over almost every national system, international comparisons, mm -hmm show the rule of thumb is if you have voluntary contribution you're going to have half of the uh, workforce so i proposed um I, I think we've talked about my plan with kevin hassett looking very far to my to my right he advised um president trump and his council of economic advisors we both have a plan um to really bring everybody into a retirement plan from the very beginning that they work whether they work on and off like my cousins in intermittent or informal employment, formal and informal employment. You just contribute, just like you play, you contribute your social security plan. And that money is managed professionally um, and it's only available for when you leave for retirement. And you also distribute the tax subsidies uh, for that plan in a much more equal way. So we need a mandatory universal um, pension system that goes along with social security. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll come back at the, the third and final question with policy recommendations. So Andrew, you know, I'll give you some time to think about what, you, what you'd recommend, but I want to turn to the second question, which is, you know, the, the Federal Reserve has been rapidly increasing interest rates. Uh, and we're hearing a lot of discussion about inflation, the possibility of a recession, and the Federal Reserve hitting the brakes too hard and having a hard landing for the economy. Are, are, is this going to impact retirees, or are Social Security going to have a nice cost of living increase so retirees won't feel a, a thing? How is, how is inflation and interest rates affect retirees and other disproportionate impacts on retirees versus other consumers? Well, that's a, that's a real good question. Um, I think it, it's on average, and you know, averages can be deceiving. On average, I think retirees will come through this better than working age households. One reason is that retirees tend to be net asset holders. They have a lot of inv investments in, in their retirement accounts. They tend to own their homes outright. So in, in those cases, uh, higher interest rates can sometimes be beneficial. Likewise, retirees are mostly out of the labor market. And so if we do have a hard landing, it's obviously going to hit younger people more. But again, it's a very it's a very mixed bag because those higher interest rates are coming with higher inflation. Some retirees, the lowest income retirees, will tend to be mostly protected by Social Security. People at the top are be protected because they'll have their assets as a hedge. It's folks in the middle where I worry a little bit more about that. So there, there isn't a single story to tell. Um, and I think we just have to see you know, how things are gonna play out over time. Teresa, any additional thoughts? Yeah, you want to bottle this answer. I agree with everything um, Andrew said. I, I do yes, want to point, <laughs> I, I point out though, um, there's some people that may even be um, uh, very much benefited from the higher interest rates. And those are retirees that have put some of their savings in very conservative accounts. You know, so they're seeing actually the benefit of, of interest rates on their savings. The stories that we're hearing about retirees that are really suffering from price increases are, are pretty typical. They are people, like Andrew says, are poor and they rely on most of their income from Social Security. And true, the Social Security benefits are indexed to inflation. Things would be a lot worse if they did it, but that social security was never enough to begin with. And so their fate, and if they rent and they don't own their houses, their rent is going up. So we saw last, um, you know, last month, Jason and Andrew, I, I'm sure you were shocked by it, that the poverty among elders in this country has gone up. And some of that is just their income has not gone up, but it's probably underreported how much, um, fragility they're facing because their other costs have gone up. 
and not really in line with um, with Social Security. This is a good, you know, segue to sort of our last suite of questions because, you know, for all the partisanship and rancor we're seeing in Congress right now and across America, the one area where there's a lot of bipartisan agreement is on retirement security and trying to help people save for retirement and then secure a better financial security in retirement. And Congress, you know, passed Secure Act, uh, we call it now 1.0, and they're currently considering a suite of bipartisan bills aimed at addressing and improving retirement security which we're often now referring to as 2.0 version of the SECURE Act. And does what's being considered in Congress now do enough to help retirement and people in retirement? Is it not going far enough? Are there things we're missing? So Teresa, I'll ask you, and then Andrew, I'll ask you to sort of close out with what you think we should be doing. Teresa? Yeah. Um, I wish I could say that they're going to, um, that these proposals will solve a significant amount of the problem, um, but it just won't. And I think a lot of the worst ideas in the bill have gotten preserved and some of the best ones got thrown out. Um, let, let me just say the clearinghouse for people to find their lost accounts is a good idea. The Pension Rights Center is one of that. It's still there, um, but it's not going to move any, you know, the needle on mm -hmm. average at all. It'll help one or two people, you know, a, a, um, a handful of people. Um, it has two other things that people that we might like, but it really is regressive and doesn't help the retirement inequality. It certainly makes the tale of two retirements, the inequality much, much worse. And that's allowing people to delay collecting from their IRAs without a, a, an income tax penalty from 70 to 72. Well, that helps the people who don't need their IRAs until they're older. They have a lot more in their accounts. And then this other wacky idea to provide better catch-up contributions for people who are over 60. That's the idea that you get more of a tax mm -hmm. break if you even put more money into your social security. And that really only helps people at the top. There's only a handful of people who actually get real wage increases after the age of 40 and 50, you know, wage increases that beat inflation. A disproportionate um, a number of those are white men um, with professional degrees. So if you want a proposal to help white men with professional degrees and high incomes, this would be the um, the legislation for you. And Andrew, in the final like minute and a half we have, do you think Secure Act 2.0 is, you know, Teresa's point, there's some good and some bad. So it's like other cases, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Is there more that Congress should be doing they're not talking about? What do you what do you think we should be looking at? What should Congress do? Well, I'm a, I'm a white man with a professional degree, so I should like the bill, but the reality is I don't really like it much more than Teresa does. The reality is, and I agree with Teresa on this, that financial incentives to participate in retirement plans don't do a heck of a lot. The provisions in the SECURE Act that uh, were much touted in the press of moving towards automatic enrollment for 401ks are so weak and watered down. I don't think they're going to have any effect on retirement savings. At the end of the day, you know, I'm optimistic about our system, but if you think more people need to be saving for retirement, we either have to automatically enroll them or we have to mandatorily enroll, enroll them. The, the, the shifting of the deck chairs around in the SECURE Act, I'm not saying it's, it's all bad, and Teresa makes some good points, but it's at the end of the day, if you are one of these people who thinks we face a retirement crisis, the SECURE Act and SECURE Act 2.0 aren't nearly enough to do the job. Yeah. Well, I, we are running out of time, and I would love to make the offer to have you guys come back on again so we could have another 15-minute chat and just talk about solutions because we could get into how we can help people delay claiming Social Security, how we can help people yeah. better annuitize or partially annuitize their 401k balances. Uh, so we'll put that up to Yahoo Finance to bring us back on and do us again at some point for another 15 minutes. Uh, but for now, I'll say thank you and thank you all for joining us. Now I'll hand it back to Rochelle uh, Akufo for more on the personal finance side of these important issues. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jason. Now, the last thing we have for you today is a conversation with three personal finance experts. We'll be joined by Jean Chatsky, the CEO of Her Money, David Blanchett, the head of retirement research at PGIM, and Ida Rademacher, the executive director of the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program, right after this. A big thank you to Jean, David, and Ida for joining us. So first, for a lot of people who are looking at their 401ks, they're seeing what's happening. For those who are currently in retirement or those who are approaching retirement, I wonder if each of you could give just a piece of advice for people who are worried about how inflation is going to be affecting them in the years ahead. Jean, if I could start with you, please. 
Sure, absolutely. And I think controlling the things that you can control is sort of the order of the day. When we're looking at inflation, when we're looking at the volatile markets, when we're looking at interest rates, there's only so much that an individual can do to right their financial situation. And grabbing onto those things is really the key to being resilient during these times. And so if you can get yourself to focus on your budget and making sure that you're paying attention to where your money is going, that you're tracking your spending, that you're spending in a way that makes sense to you and you're not going overboard, particularly as we head into the holiday season, Also, when you're looking at those interest rates, now's the time to try to grab a little bit of additional money on your cash. Now's the time to be aggressive in the areas where you know that you can be aggressive. And just try to keep your head down and and move ahead on the straight and narrow, and, and you'll get through it over time. And David, advice from you. Obviously, it can be quite overwhelming for people looking at their 401ks, especially right now. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is that inflation is a very personal number, right? The the CPI is a, a weighted basket of goods that all Americans consume. And so first kind of understand how this has affected you. I think more importantly, the question is, is, is what do you want to do going forward? And I think that for a lot of folks, for example, who weren't maybe interested in delaying claiming Social Security, it gives them an option to kind of hedge against in future inflation uh, increases. So I think the key, the, the key thing is to understand what it what it's done for you and what you can do in the future if this happens again. And also, Ida, for you, because a lot of people are wondering, should I retire? Should I hold off on it? What sort of advice do you have for people who are trying to really try and make these decisions right now? Yeah, I think I'd I'd follow suit with the advice already given for those who are close to retiring as we look at inflation and recession. I'd I'd point out that for those that are younger in their working careers, uh, there is... uh, less retirement savings uh, for those, you know, we still have about uh, 57 million people in the U.S. who didn't have access to retirement savings. Uh, Those who have long horizons uh, should take part in their plans and and there's policy changes that are going to make that even uh, more accessible for people to have retirement savings plans. So the long-term practices shouldn't change the idea of investing in your future and if anything, the, the sobering realities of what's happening right now in terms of both rising costs and uh, and the need for thinking about long-term savings should be should be something that that doesn't dissuade you from from investing and from saving for retirement. And Jean, Ida raises a good point. Obviously, we already have high inflation that people are dealing with, also potentially planning for a recession, depending on whether the Fed can stick that soft landing. So when you have this sort of one-two punch, how does that affect people depending on the saving and income levels that they're at? Yeah, it's incredibly different depending on where you are. We know that this kind of a one-two punch impacts people at lower incomes, people living paycheck to paycheck most because they don't have the wiggle room to deal with inflation. But Ida made a terrific point that, you know, if you are older and if you're at your higher earning levels and you can, in fact, delay retirement um, for a little while, opt not to retire, not to make those big changes right now, even hanging on for another six months, another year, another year and a half, if you can, gives you that opportunity to delay social security, to allow the money in your retirement accounts to continue to to grow because you're contributing to it, but also potentially to come back from this sort of a, a downfall. And, and for those folks in the middle, if you don't have, as she said, the opportunity to contribute to a work-based plan, getting into an IRA, getting into um, some sort of a plan for retirement that you have ginned up yourself is, is really the order of the day. You know, many of the strategies that we're talking about are, are the tried and true sort of save, invest, stay with it, don't panic. Um, but that's what's going to get us through this period. And David, a lot of people are wondering, how can I protect what I already have? Or perhaps how can I maximize what I already have? Talk about some of perhaps the policies or the new ideas that are in the best position to protect these sorts of investments. 
I think that again, you know, everyone's in a different spot in terms of saving for retirement, right? I think that, you know, there's there's definitely under savings. I think that individuals haven't saved enough. And so the first thing we need to do is get people to save more. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I think we need to increase coverage and increase savings rates. And then I think as you as you approach retirement, you start asking questions, you know, how am I gonna make the income that I have, or excuse me, the savings that I have last for a lifetime. And that's a really tough thing to figure out. So I think that we need to give people um, more access to savings, better strategies, help them kind of figure out how they're going to make their money last. And Jim, people in the middle class seem to be getting squeezed the most in these sort of situations because they are actually at greater risk of running out of money in retirement. How should they go about protecting themselves? You know, it's interesting, this this question of running out of money in retirement is not one that we have really educated people on nearly enough. We, we've talked for years about the, the need to accumulate money for retirement. You should save, you should max out, you should grab the matching dollars in your 401k, you should open an IRA or a SEP IRA if you don't have access. Contribute, contribute, contribute. But the question of running out is, is a very different question and requires a strategy that is just as well thought out because we're talking about a period of retirement that can last 30, 40 years. And so that involves thinking about things like, how can I delay Social Security so that I am able to get the most for that investment that I've made in my own future? How can I put my career into a trajectory so that I can continue to work and put off taking social security in, until I'm full retirement age or even longer. And then it involves thinking about things like ways to make the money that you've saved yourself last. We're, we're embarking on an era where more plans will be able to offer things like annuities, within retirement plans. That's going to beg some understanding. It's going to require increased education. But those are the sort of strategies that particularly people in the middle class are going to need to think about in order to make sure that their money goes the distance. And Ida, as we know, when it, when it comes to money, when it comes to anything really simple and easy, don't always go hand in hand. And a lot of people are actually sacrificing some of their essentials to try and make ends meet because of inflation. So Ida, are there any sort of public policy proposals that are either in place or in the works to really help people so that they don't have to make some of these very hard choices? Yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, people's people don't just have a, a short-term financial life and a long-term financial life and then the rest of their life. They 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 have to think about their health care, their housing, their retirement, and they have to think about that now. And as Jean said, uh, for longer and longer lifespans. And those issues are especially critical for women who tend to have even longer lifespans and have, you know, a wage gap and a wealth gap uh, to contend with as well. Many also work part-time, and there has been relatively few opportunities for retirement savings and part-time work, and that is hopefully another thing that will change. And I think the other thing that is critical, especially during a recession or any time, is just understanding that uh, people today who are working and are trying to even extend those working years like we just talked about are probably going to be working with multiple employers over time. And the savings you accumulate here or there in very small pots often don't talk to each other. They don't connect. They don't actually come into the same account. So increasingly, when we really want to help folks, we want to think both about uh, the portability of retirement savings. We want to make it easy for them. And we need to think as well about how else do we manage expenses? And not just as an individual level, which is important, but uh, in terms of policy, you know, the biggest issues in, ter in addition to savings and continuing to work and get earned income is what's going to happen with rising costs. Uh, Long-term care insurance, health insurance, all of those things come into play as well. And there's other policy dimensions that we should be thinking of as well to help make sure that as much of the routinely positive cash flow people are getting into their wallets uh, can stay with them to handle the essentials. 
And it's tough because obviously, David, you can only plan for so much. Obviously, nobody saw COVID coming. And with inflation at a 40 year high, you have an entire generation of people who've never experienced inflation on these levels. So when people are trying to really figure out how they can ensure that their retirement accounts for some of these potential inflation risks, what sort of strategies do you recommend? Well, I mean, the problem is, is there's not necessarily a ton of strategies out there that are that are linked directly to inflation. I think we've we've all mentioned this already, but the one strategy that does have an explicit inflation hedge is the late claim of Social Security uh, benefits are linked to the CPIW. It's a it's a great way to kind of hedge both inflation risk and longevity risk. I think that you know, and there's a, a need for other types of investments called real assets and portfolios. Um, you know, things like commodities, things like tips. Um, infrastructure, uh, assets that just tend to do well when inflation is higher. I think that too often investors think about just stocks and bonds. I think adding things to portfolios that, that can help ensure when inflation is high, the portfolio is better is really important for investors that have 20 or 30 uh, a year time horizon. And Jean, how do you see protected income playing a role in this, the sort of strategy that people can have? Look, I'm a, I'm a fan of making sure that you've got enough protected lifetime income to at least cover your fixed costs. I think we would all agree that the length of retirement is so long, you, you are going to need growth on your investments throughout. You're gonna need money in the market throughout retirement in order to do things like keeping up with inflation, but having enough protected income in the form of social security, any pensions, if you're fortunate enough to have them, and many people are not these days, most people are not these days, um, as well as um, annuities that you have uh, crafted or picked up along the way, just enough to make sure that you can keep a roof over your head, that you can make your Medicare premium payments, that you can put food on the table, that you know that your fixed costs are covered and that you don't have to worry about those things. The, the wild card, and, and Ida talked about this, is, is healthcare and, and long-term care. And that's where it gets very, very difficult to ensure for the outcomes because we don't know what the outcomes are going to be. So then, David, a lot of people then get a lot of acronyms about different sort of accounts that they can use to perhaps help them with market volatility or as best as they can be an inflation hedge. Are there specific types, though, of retirement accounts that, that you would recommend that it will help better protect people? Well, you know, I know there's certain types of accounts, right? I mean, there's 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 401ks, there's IRAs, there's taxable accounts and all that. I think that I think the key is really kind of trying to understand you know, how this all makes you feel to some extent, right? I think that that, that I, I, I work for an investment company, we spend all day building these efficient portfolios, but, and this is maybe to Gene's point, if you can't sleep because the market's down 25%, inflation's up 8%, you have the wrong strategy. I think that, that, that there's there's the academic aspect of these decisions and the behavioral aspect. I think that, that there, there are assets that you can include in portfolios, but to me there's, there's these larger structural issues about how do I craft a, a plan that, that makes me comfortable with all the uncertainties that exist out there. So I think that that's kind of the key is, is understanding not only what is the, the right kind of um, portfolio aspect of things, but also just the right strategy. And David, you raise an interesting point because obviously everyone has their own personal relationship with, with money and risk that's really going to inform how they approach these things. And you mentioned, if these are the sort of things keeping you up at night, perhaps a different strategy, a different sort of retirement account. Um, I, I want to bring you in here because as we look at the demographics, how they're changing, by 2024, the US is expected to hit peak 65 when the greatest surge of Americans turning 65 um, come, comes into play. So when you think of things like employers and, and financial professionals, what role do you think this holistically can all play in really improving the outcomes for some of these retirement savings accounts? Yeah, it's a great point. And, uh, and as Jean said, you know, even though pensions defined benefit plans are on the wane, uh, this is the last generation that had uh, some kind of a high proportion of folks that had access to that. And of course, those pension plans did help with the cost of living as it rises. Uh, when you're in just 401k savings or uh, or you don't have any savings at all, these are the things that we have to start to contend with as we look at uh, retirement policy uh, for those 65 and below and how we make sure that we have access for every worker uh, in this country. Because of that, the role that employers play is critical and it's changing rapidly. Uh, we really have seen a whole new generation of benefits uh, coming together 
on some of the platforms in terms of your benefits bundle to help people manage both their short and long-term financial lives. Uh, so emergency savings offered through an employer, uh, increasingly, uh, obviously, the other kinds of different savings accounts that are helpful. Uh, we've been looking at uh, people even just in terms of scheduling for folks so that they can pursue either multiple jobs or jobs in career education. It's not too late to think about what is the additional way to get, get training uh, to continue to stay viable in the labor market for longer. Uh, I think that we're excited to also look at the next generation of benefits being the way that private employer benefits operate in tandem with public benefits and the safety net that's out there, because that's going to be important in an inflationary space as well. Uh, I think that the more employers really understand uh, that the priorities of some grow rising generations are, are paying off student loan debt and some of the new retirement legislation that's uh, uh, being working through Congress right now kind of recognizes and incentivizes employers to help uh, address student loan debt at the same time they're helping people build for retirement. So I would say watch this space. This is a place for employers who care about the financial well-being of their workers to really lean in uh, on an exciting new set of innovations and benefits that are going to be coming online in the next few years. So Jean, then as we look at this sort of next generation of benefits, it, it does sort of shake up what we traditionally look at when we think of financial planning, not just obviously social security education, but things like how we approach student loans, but even health and lifestyle as well. Tell us more about that and how people could, should be considering that also as part of their financial planning. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that um, you can't separate health and and wellness, health and, and financial wellness anymore. If you, if you are not healthy, um, going forward, your financial life is very quickly going to um, run off the tracks. And if you don't have your finances working for you, that may be okay in your 20s and your 30s, but by the time you get to your 40s and 50s and 60s, it's gonna be much harder to stay healthy if you don't have the money to do that. Employers are, are realizing this, and they're also realizing that their workforce is counting on them to um, step up and help them with all aspects of their their wellness, not just their health and their financial wellness, but their their mental health as well. There's been a lot of research on this, and employees are willing to switch jobs today to jump to a company that they believe actually cares about them in these areas. So I think Ida's right. I think we are on on just the the precipice of a whole new. Um, layer of, of benefits offerings that that will help with these things and I would say you know for consumers we know there there's a very frustrating statistic out there that consumers spend less time choosing their health plan each year than they spend time choosing a vacation right they don't we don't pay enough attention to these things for consumers it's your job to actually pay attention in October in open enrollment to see what your employer is teeing up and to see if you can actually find some additional resources to help you during these difficult times. And just lastly, I mean, obviously policymakers trying to push things forward to help with retirement savings. I wanna, I wanna just get quickly each of you, your reaction. I spoke to Senator Marshall earlier and he discussed the bipartisan retirement security legislation currently being negotiated in Congress, commonly referred to as um, Secure 2.0. Now he sounded very skeptical about the passage, essentially saying that it's dead in the water as the administration has its other priorities. So I just want to get one of his Soundbite. You know, unfortunately, with 13% inflation over the last two years, there's just not much in there that could be a game changer. That's the real problem here. The real problem is inflation and the stock market tanking because of horrible policies coming out of the White House. So, David, I want to first start with your take. Is, is there anything you think perhaps either policymakers or, or even the private sector could really be doing to at least make retirement savings more resilient? I mean, to me, I think that the biggest thing is, is just a more coverage. I think that um, we're doing well by the folks who have access to employer-sponsored defined contribution plans. You do more as a country to give access to these plans, these strategies to help people who aren't saved, who can't save via their employer. So I'd like to see more movement there. And Ida? Yeah, I definitely would echo David there. Uh, uh, I 
would say that if if there's ever a place to look for hope, uh, there, you know, the the retirement legislation uh, passed unanimously in the House, uh, or I think there were five votes against, 400 something for, and in the Senate it passed uh, out of committee. Uh, with with all Republican and Democratic support. So I do think that there's momentum. Uh, people are starting to make this kitchen table issue uh, a national policy issue that can get bipartisan support. So I don't think that uh, my own sense of hearing from different stakeholders in this mix is that we shouldn't have hope uh, that we can and do need to do more on retirement savings. Obviously, the access issues. And then for those that are lower income, it's also important to think about how we actually structure and incentivize savings so that it can accumulate. So a refundable savers credit, expanding and, and simplifying the savers credit for those uh, lower income uh, savers is, is also critical. Uh, again, the emergency saving aspects, the connection student loan, starting to think about an inclusive savings and investment system in this country, not just the infrastructure in the market space, but how do we create the policy environment that actually creates a lifetime opportunity to save and invest in your financial future? Angie, lastly, your, your ideal outlook here. Um, look, I, there's a lot of good in this in this bill that that um, we we all hope will will be able to move forward. It it provides for emergency savings. It provides for um, additional automation into uh, into retirement plans, which is fantastic because we know that when when people are automatically enrolled, um, enrollment goes up. But I would say for now, you know, don't forget the states. There are a number of states that have in the past few years put work and save programs into place for smaller employers that don't have 401ks, that don't have work-based retirement plans so that they can make paycheck deductions flow into IRAs. And when that happens, workers are 15 times more likely to save. Other states are, are following Oregon and New York in teeing this up. Maryland's got uh, got something moving along. So, you know, we, we hope that, that we'll see more of those as well. It's great when it occurs on a federal level, but the states have a lot that they can accomplish too. Well, we'll have to leave it there, but a big thank you to our panelists. We do appreciate you joining us today. And from all of us at the Bipartisan Policy Center and Yahoo Finance, a big thank you for joining us. Take care. The IMF downgraded its outlook for the global economy in 2023, forecasting more than a third of the world economy will contract and emphasize possible widespread emerging market debt distress Yo, finds his Jen Schonberger is here with the details. Jen, not a good look, not a good way to start the session if you're a bull in this market. That's right, Brian. The IMF downgrading its outlook for the global economy based on effects of the war in Ukraine, global inflation that remains high and that will require aggressive rate hikes and a slowdown in China. To reiterate some of those numbers, the IMF now forecasts global growth will slow next year by two tenths of a percent to 2.7 percent. Uh, that's down from 2.9 percent estimated back in July. They say there's also a 25 percent chance growth falls lower than that. Now, that would be down from 3.2 percent projected this year. More than a third of the global economy will contract this year or next, while the three largest economies, the U.S., the EU and China, will continue to stall. The IMF expects growth in the U.S. to clock in at 1.6 percent this year. That's seven tenths of a percent lower than forecast in July, with growth of 1 percent in 2023. IMF chief economist Pierre Oliver Gorinches says, in short, the worst is yet to come. And for many people, 2023 will feel like a recession. Now, the IMF warns that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is destabilizing the global economy, pointing to a energy crisis that is ignited in Europe, raising their overall cost of living and hurting the economy there. The IMF also warning of the risk of monetary, fiscal or financial policy miscalibration, which has risen. They are already seeing stress in markets. They warn that over tightening by global central banks could cause an unnecessarily harsh recession. Now, they also said there's the risk of widespread emerging market debt distress if there is over tightening. Yet the IMF also saying that it's important for global banks 
to raise rates aggressively, front load those rate hikes to make sure that inflation remains in check. As for the IMF's outlook for global inflation, they are forecasting global inflation will peak late this year, but remain elevated for longer than previously expected. They see inflation of 8.8% this year, declining to 6.5% next year before decreasing to a little over 4% in 2024. Brian? Jen, uh, thanks so much for breaking that down. Just while we have you, did want to follow up real quick here because it's really alarming what you mentioned. In short, the worst is yet to come. And for many people, 2023 going to feel like a recession. That coming from Pierre Olivier Gorinches, as you mentioned a moment ago. They also had gone on to say the, the sharp appreciation of the U.S. dollar adding significance, um, significantly to domestic price pressures. What more are they saying around the different values of currencies and, and what this means for the global picture, too? Yeah, I mean, Brad, we are very much walking a tightrope here. Uh, we're going to be interviewing uh, that chief economist of the IMF that you mentioned at 1130. And a question that uh, we have for him is, since things remain so fragile, any sort of black swan event, whether we see an escalation in Russia or there is over tightening, does that tip this global economy into recession? And on your question of the dollar, uh, you know, certainly that has implications for capital flows, particularly for emerging market economies. If they have debt that are, is denominated in dollars, then that really increases their debt expense. And there, we do know that there are large debt loads at this point um, coming off of the pandemic. And so that really raises the risk of some sort of potential debt crisis. Um, you know, for the U.S., obviously, we've got a strengthening dollar. So that means maybe we're going to be importing more and exporting less. So that perhaps hurts our GDP domestically. ARK Invest's Kathy Wood taking aim at the Federal Reserve at a new open letter saying the central bank has shocked not just the U.S., but the world, and raise the risks of a deflationary bust. Alexander, Alexander Semenova is here with more. Uh, not entirely clear what prompted her to write this letter. What is she else is she saying? What does she want the Fed to do? Well, Dave, for starters, if Kathy Wood has something to say, you better believe that she will find a creative way to get her messaging across. Yeah. This time she had something to say to Federal Reserve officials, so she did the most Kathy Wood thing she can do and penned an open letter to the U.S. Central Bank. She argued that they're making a big mistake by over-hiking rates uh, and that FOMC members are using lagging indicators to dictate their policy decisions, specifically citing employment and what she referred to as a downstream inflation and said that over-hiking rates risks a deflationary bust. Now, even as key price measures like CPI and PCE continue to come in stubbornly high, she insists that declining prices in some commodities like lumber and copper actually suggest that we're heading toward deflation. She also notes that the monthly jobs report, which again showed robust hiring last month, uh, isn't telling the full story and pointed to increasing uh, jobless claims and uh, job openings. Now, obviously, the speculative tech stocks that comprise ARK Invest's ET FS are taking a big hit from the Federal Reserve. Yeah. So she's continuously been sending this message message across. But the point here is that, um, you know, what she says in the letter is not that far off now from Wal what Wall Street appears to be thinking as well, which is that the Fed is overshooting now. She made a point that rising food prices are caused by the war in Ukraine and that these are factors that the Fed can't actually resolve by tightening monetary policy. Now, the interesting thing is BlackRock actually had a similar message. They also said that the Fed is trying to combat uh, factors that are contribu contributing to inflation that, you know, they can't fix with uh, raising interest rates. So when you have ARK Invest and BlackRock on the same page, that's pretty significant here. Three straight 75s. Safe to say we're going to hear from her again after what looks like a fourth 75-point hike in a row. Alexander Semenova, thank you. Great stuff. All right, let's take a broader look at the markets and the action today with Jim Paulson, the Lethal Group Chief Investment Strategist. Jim, good to see you. Let's, uh, we want to get to this massive market rally on a Monday, but first your thoughts on that warning from the UN. Should the Fed consider uh, developing economies around the world when lifting rates? Well, I, I think that I, I agree that the Fed uh, should pause and, or should get ready to pause. I mm -hmm. think that 
the rate <clears throat> movements on the upside are getting way out of bounds, David, compared to a number of things. We've got the, until today, we've had the 10-year treasury yield going straight north while commodity prices are collapsing, while inflation surprise index is falling uh, overall, while the ISM surveys for service pricing or manufacturing pricing is, is collapsing. Um, there's just getting increasingly out of bounds. Yields now in relation to inflation expectations um, break even uh, points in the bond market are all way, way high relative to their historic norms. They're in contractionary areas, certainly. So if the UN has a case, I, I'm not sure the Fed should have such a broad mandate that it considers all these different groups. I, I, I'm i more of an old school, it has two <laughs> mandates, sort of um, unemployment rate and inflation, and probably inflation is number one, employment two. And if they start uh, entertaining too many mandates, I think it gets them in trouble. Uh, they're really not built for that. Jim, when you make up today's rally, because yes, it is a rally off the lows, the lowest levels that we have seen in a couple years, yet the Dow still up 877 points, S&P up nearly 3% as well as the NASDAQ. Do you think that this is just a brief bear market rally, or is there any reason to think that today's gains have, have some legs? Well, we're very oversold. There's no doubt about that. We had a lot of extreme pessimism at the end of the last week. Uh, so, you know, are we due for a a bounce, a, 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 paw, a rally, a pause in the bear, certainly. Um, and that could be part of what is happening today. But uh, I'm I'm fairly bullish in here, Rachel. I, I think that things have gotten too extreme on the rate front, too extreme on the currency front. Um, I think policy officials around the globe are going to have to switch gears to stopping tightening here soon. Um, I think the valuation of equity markets are, are pretty compelling. we got to 17 trailing PE multiple in the S&P 500 uh, uh, before today, which was lower than 70% of the time since 1990. Pessimism has been extremely, extremely high on almost any sentiment measure you look at. Um, typically, historically, when you look back over the post-war era, peak inflationary periods are great buying opportunities for the stock market if you look forward one year. Uh, and I, I think we're in that realm. So I don't know if this is the bottom and this is it. I mean, um, it certainly wouldn't surprise me if it's just kind of a dead cat bounce, but uh, I'm not too worried about it. I think investors shouldn't worry about what's gonna happen over the next few weeks or even the rest of this year. But think about where this thing could be in a year. And I think if you draw a big circle down here and you're buying today, 12 months out, you're gonna be happy you did. Jim, and I know you just said, don't worry about the next few weeks or what's happening from here until the end of the year. But I'm going to ask you about that because so many investors are closely watching what the Fed is doing. I know you said that you think the Fed should pause its rate, uh, should pause its rate hikes. When do you expect, though, the Fed to pivot? Well, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at the November meeting they, they do a rate hike that's far less than the 75 they've been doing. Uh, they could do maybe 25 and 50. And I think they might take a pause after that. I mean, to me, we're at the point to where um, we, we've had, to me, sufficient tightening, Rachel, in the pipeline since March of 2021. We've had a tremendous drop in the money supply growth rate from 27% down to basically 4% year on year. Fiscal juice was 18.5% of GDP back in March of 2021. It's now down to 3%. The dollar's gone up 25%. Bond yields across the curve have been, some of them have been rising really since 2020. So there's, regardless of what the Fed's going to do, there's enough in the pipeline already with about a one-year lag that's going to keep inflation going down. I think the war on inflation has already been won. We just don't know it yet. And so I think the Fed is, is uh, getting irresponsibly tightening now into the taking too much risk of aborting this recovery when they really don't have to. And I think that's going to become clearer and clearer. This morning, we got information that Credit Suisse is in, uh, in peril a bit. Um, you know, that's weighing on the positive bid for the Treasury mark today. Um, we also got ISM uh, reports on manufacturing um, that showed a, a more weakness than perceived. Um, there's just going to be building more and more data that's suggesting that real growth is slowing and inflation is slowing and the Fed has probably have to pause. And if the market picks up that they're going to pause, this market could rip. 
And Jim, we know that obviously the Fed got caught on the back foot sort of being late to the game when it came to trying to tamper down inflation. And you're saying that the war has already been won on inflation, but because of this lag in the data, we're still waiting for it to catch up. So then when you look at things like the strength of the dollar and what we've consistently seen with consumer sentiment, how do you expect that to play out for the rest of the year? Well, if you look back historically, Rachel, consumer sentiment uh, in the United States and everywhere, really, not only consumer sentiment, but small business sentiment, CEO sentiment, they are strongly, closely correlated in an inverse fashion with the annual rate of inflation. What, what destroys confidence more than anything is, is, a, is rising inflation rates. This has been going on all the way back to World War II. Uh, for example, some of the big major bottoms in incompetence was 1970, 1974, 1980, which coincided with the peaks and the big inflationary burst of the 1970s. This is no different. Confidence has been destroyed in the last 15 months or so as inflation has accelerated. In fact, by the University of Michigan major went to its all-time lowest recorded reading. But here's the deal. In the last three months, consumer confidence now has risen three months in a row off those lows. Small business confidence has risen in recent months. CEO confidence has risen in recent months. Why? Because inflation peaked and is starting to come down. And that's resurrecting confidence. So one of the things that could, uh, a resurrection of confidence has two implications. One, typically without a massive inflation, the thing that really makes a recession much worse is that you go into it with generally sky high confidence and then you destroy confidence on Main Street, which lengthens and deepens the recession. We won't do that here because confidence has already been destroyed. We're heading into a slowdown with confidence starting to revive, which will buffer us against a, a, a contraction overall. The other thing is if animal spirits start to revive here, that's going to run right through Main Street economy and also help the stock market uh, revive as well. So confidence is playing a big role. The destruction of it is hurt in the last year. But now that inflation's peaking, I expect confidence to be continuing to rise now as we look forward. We'll certainly be keeping an eye on it. A big thank you there, Jim Paulson, the Newtold Group Chief Investment Strategist. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Well, we close out the quarter, as we said, with the Fed's preferred inflation gauge coming in stronger than expected. Also this morning, Fed Vice Chair Leo Brainerd warning against retreating from the fight against price pressures too early. Joining us now is Michael Gapin, Bank of America Global Research Head of U.S. Uh, economics here. And um, let's start with that number that we got this morning. Certainly something a lot of investors are watching. Core PCE up 0.6% month on month. Uh, nearly 5% year on year, stronger than expected. But what do you take away from that when you consider the sole focus right now for the central bank being about taming inflation? Right. So some of that upward revision and stronger than expected data was about methodological changes on how they account for used car prices within the, in the index. So some of that strength is a methodology issue, but it's not all of the strength. So I think that the conclusion here is, is there are still broad-based underlying price pressures in the U.S. economy. And so what early on in the pandemic seemed like this transitory story about goods has broadened out over, over time, and the data suggests it's even a little bit more persistent than, than we had thought before. So it certainly cues up a Fed that's likely to continue to lean against the wind, wanting to keep monetary policy tight or moving into restrictive territory in order to bring inflation lower. Michael, when you look at the market moves, um, you know, we got a number of um, Fed officials speaking this week that seem to suggest that, look, investors are finally getting this message about where the central bank's focus is. And yet, when you look at a day like yesterday when we saw a big sell-off, you still have to wonder if the expectations are aligned with where, in fact, the economy is right now. Uh, when you look at some of those moves, what do you think they're missing right now in terms of where we are headed domestically? Actually, I don't think it's missing a lot. When when an economist like myself looks at it, where are financial conditions? We're looking at more than than just, of course, where where equity markets are. In in your prior segment, you spoke about the dollar, that certainly moved quite a bit, and we would need to look at the level of of yields and spreads and and so forth. So across a a number of indicators, both in currency markets, rate markets, with real rates moving higher, and equity markets back to roughly around June lows. 
financial conditions have tightened a lot. So I, I would argue that markets have gotten the message and and are pricing things you know appropriately for for the outlook. Obviously, that will change over time as as the data evolves and Fed policy evolves. But I, I do think markets have received the message, and that's one of expecting tighter financial conditions for longer, which is having an adverse effect on on several markets. Uh, we have continued to see relative strength in the labor market. We got that number yesterday on weekly unemployment claims, you know, not something that often moves the market, but we did see uh, it coming in at a five month low, which, you know, raises the question of uh, to what extent the Fed's policy has actually taken hold. How are you looking at, at that piece of this? And you know, when we hear the Fed chair talk about some pain that Americans need to be bracing right. for, what does that look like to you? Yeah, I mean, this is the tricky part for the Fed, right? Because as the backdrop, the economy is rotating to services as we reopen and emerge from the pandemic. So you would expect the good side of the economy to be weak anyway. And now we have the Fed tightening, which should put more weakness on the good side. So it's really hard to kind of decipher exactly how much Fed policy is working at the moment. And, and so I think in this myriad of data that's really dispersed, what does the Fed do? And I think in the end, you hit you hit on the point that the Fed's going to be focused on the labor market. It's going to be focused on on payroll growth. And so it's going to know its policy setting is correct when payroll growth starts to slow in a way that would tell them, yes, our, our policy is, is restrictive. Right now, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, last month, over 300,000 jobs added. Consensus is looking for a similar size number uh, next week. So we, we think the labor market is pretty robust and the Fed has more work to do in order to slow the labor market down. That's why we're all kind of looking for, you know, say another 125 basis points of rate hikes by the end of the year. Well, that was going to be my next question, given that there's still some data that's about to come out between now and the next FOMC meeting. Okay, 125 basis points by the end of next year. How long does this rate hiking cycle continue when you look into 2023? Well, we think it extends into the early part of, of next year. So we, we have 75 basis points of hikes in November and then 50 in December. And then we have another another 50 by the March meeting of, of next year. So I think it can extend into the early part. Of, of next year. Our forecast is that you know, things will be slowing in the first half of, of next year, consistent with a harder landing than the Fed is, is forecasting. So I, I do think by the time we get into the first quarter, the slowdown in the data will, will be more, more evident, including labor market data. And so the Fed can tighten more rapidly through the end of this year than they slow down a bit, we think, stop by March. Okay, well, I'll be watching if that timeline holds. Michael Gapin, good to have you on on this Friday. Bank of America, Global Research Head of U.S. Economics. Stocks are on track to finish the week, month, and quarter in the red due to the last impact of the pandemic, high inflation, and the Fed's aggressive tightening cycle to curb it all. But Wisdom Tree's senior investment strategy advisor and author of the investment classic Stocks for the Long Run, Jeremy Siegel maintains that argument even in today's environment. He joins me now with Wisdom Tree Global Chief Investment Advisor and contributor to the book, Jeremy Schwartz. Uh, Professor Siegel, let me let's start with you here. What grade would you give the Fed here? Uh, a D, barely. <laughs> Why is that? Well, first of all, they're responsible for the inflation by being way too accommodative and way too late in their beginning of the tightening. And then I believe that they're going overboard in the other direction, or at least indicating by their uh, dot plot for 2023 that they're going to become uh, tight for longer, which I think is going to be a big mistake on the other side. I'm not here to run PR diversion for the Fed, but I, I guess I would ask with some of the layered on challenges that they're navigating as well that they don't have control over, whether that's energy prices, whether that's the supply chain. When do you expect some of that to also be kind of rectified for and, and ultimately help support at least the, the Fed policy pathway? Well, the, the inflation we have is only very small part supply chain. I mean, supply chain has corrected itself dramatically. And, uh, you know, we still have inflation. We have inflation in the, in, in the background. It, it was excessive monetary expansion. The money supply has expanded 40% from the pandemic to the present time, which is the greatest in U.S. history. 
We, we have never seen expansion of money like this. And listen, inflation is the price of money. And if you supply too much of anything, its price is going to go down. And that is what inflation is. Jeremy Schwartz, let me let me go over to you. So next week, uh, new quarter, fourth quarter, but probably a lot of the same negative vibes that we've been dealing with the past three, six months. How should one invest? You know, this is one of the earnings season problems you're going to see. You, you know, the, one of the big narratives and from the professor talking about too tight of a Fed, you got a very strong dollar. Um, even Nike reported earnings today uh, and the big hit from the dollar. There's going to be headwinds to U.S. multinationals. Um, you know, people worry about valuations. Uh, I think we say valuations have come down, but you know, one of the, the professor's works, we talked a lot about high dividend investing for this environment, for volatility, for concern that even the, the big tech stocks still are more expensive than long-term averages. High dividend investing, uh, and that's what Wisdom Tree does very, very well, I think is core for the long run, but also for the, the, the current market environment that, that we face. What do, what do you believe of the long-term targets that you've heard companies lay out thus far, Jeremy Schwartz? And, and when is it actually going to be realized for some of them too? Because we've heard a lot of this over the course of the earnings season and, and we've, it's prompted us to ask our own questions about for the, for the targets that they're laying out, when investors should expect that to actually uh, turn into realized either profits or, or just margin returns? You know, you look at where earnings estimates are and, um, you know, certainly it was still a good year for earnings. You haven't really seen a big slowdown or earnings being up on the year. Analysts tend to be optimistic and overly optimistic, so you wouldn't be surprised to see estimates come down. Where we think there's some real opportunity uh, is in the small cap section of the market. This is something we also talk about in the sixth edition of Stocks for Long Run. The factors haven't worked. Small cap and value hasn't worked for 15, 16 years. But small cap value today, their stocks are priced for a deeper recession, like a nine to 10 times earnings across all of our fundamentally weighted small cap ETFs. Um, we have three of them for the US market, all are nine to 10 times earnings. We think that's overly pricing in this recession. People are getting too pessimistic on economic growth. Uh, and so for, and they're also more insulated from that strong dollar and multinationals and large caps. Uh, you know, so we like small caps at Wisdom Tree, particularly with a, a dividend bias. Professor Siegel, uh, last one to you. Do, are we just now getting a, a taste of uh, the damage that the Fed might be doing to the economy by raising rates so fast? Look, we might be sitting here six months from now and the 30-year mortgage may be at 10%, and that is going to really hammer the housing market. Well, I don't think it's getting that high, but it's near seven, and that's hammering the housing market because, first of all, prices aren't going up anymore in, in, in housing. We saw that with the case show and the national index. So- you're, you're, the people are wondering about they're buying at extremely high prices with mortgage rates more than 100% over what it was before. Um, I think you're going to see a much greater slowdown in the housing market. I think you can see a slowdown in the economy. And, um, you know, I certainly hope. I think we're, we, the short rate will go up more and the Fed will tighten, but it will not tighten as much as the market fears um, once they see the slowdown in the, in the real economy. You know, just to, just to follow up on that, one of the other benchmarks that the Fed is going to be tracking is the unemployment rate. And, and we've had some calls for that to get upwards of 4%, even upwards of 5%. Where do you believe that is going to come in at, Jeremy Siegel? Uh, well, first of all, I, you know, I, I, you know, we have to be looking you know, closely at what the, we're going to get a, you know, a week from Friday, what the employment report it was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal today about the labor hoarding. And, and, and not a lot of firms, if they see weakness in demand, will see labor, uh, instead of hoarding, disgorging, <laughs> which means we might see a dramatically weaker and even negative payroll uh, uh, reports. Uh, I think that will turn the heads of the Fed and saying, whoa, uh, here, we, you know, maybe we should not go as tight. Uh, it's, it would be a sorry, you know, to have to have that happen. But uh, I think that that is, uh, that is a possibility toward the end of the year. Wisdom Tree's Global Chief Investment Officer, Jeremy Schwartz, and Senior Investment Strategy Advisor, Jeremy Siegel, author of Stocks for the Long Run. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Joining us now to continue the market conversation, we've got Ben Snyder, Goldman Sachs U.S. Portfolio Strategy Macro Team Senior Strategist. Ben, my goodness, when you think back on this quarter and, and what the setup is going into Q4, 
where do you even begin to kind of lay out your strategy? I think there's three key issues that we're thinking about and that every one of our investor clients is thinking about right now as well. Uh, the first is interest rates. Obviously, the Fed's battle with inflation has been the key mover of equity markets so far this year. The bad news is we've seen the PE multiple for the S&P 500 fall from 21 times at the start of the year to just 15 times now. So we've seen a massive derating. The good news is this is roughly appropriate, we think. Uh, currently, market pricing is about in line with what our economists expect from the Fed for the next several meetings. And with real Treasury yields at around 1.5% on the 10-year, that's about fair value. The other key driver, of course, is earnings. And here, too, we think estimates are getting close to where they need to be. We've seen some pretty clear moves in the last several months. We still think there's a little bit more downward moves likely to come. But we think consensus earnings estimates are getting close to where they should be. And so when you put those two together, uh, the S&P is now just a hair above 3,600. That is our newly revised year-end target for this year. So we think the market is pretty close to fair value. The third key issue, and I would say the really big question mark, is positioning and flows. You know, we've seen a very, very sharp derating in markets this year. And accordingly, we've seen a very sharp degree of selling from our institutional investor clients. This is appropriate in our view, but it also raises the risk that if we get some data in the next couple months that is slightly better than expected, we could see a pretty sharp rebound, especially as investors fear uh, what could happen to their full year performance numbers as we get close to December 31st. Ben, let's, let's go back to that bad news for a second, because that's what uh, we're peddling, uh, at least right, right at this particular point, or at least I am. What is your worst case scenario for the S&P 500 and what would take it there? Yeah, so when we cut our target to 3,600, the main driver there was just simply higher rates, which reduce equity valuations. What we've seen all year, very understandable, very reasonable. Could the situation get worse? Of course. When the Fed hikes rates, they don't just reduce equity valuations, they slow growth. That's the whole point of tightening. And in slowing growth, they raise recession risk. This is not a surprise, we all know this. But if the economy actually does dip into recession, that would mean not just pressure on equity valuations, pressure on equity earnings too. And so we've put out a scenario where the S&P could fall by another 15% or so to just over 3,000, we call it 3,100, if it becomes clear that the economy is dipping into recession. Of the recession that we're even looking across in the U.S. economy, you know, how much of the global impact would, would also overflow into U.S. equity markets? 70% of S&P 500 revenues are derived here in the U.S. And likewise, the U.S. consumer is about 70% of U.S. GDP. So we have a relatively insulated global, we have a relatively insulated U.S. economy and a relatively insulated U.S. equity market. That said, of course, factors outside of the U.S. affect both growth and the monetary policy picture. We've seen just this week how interest rates in the United Kingdom, for example, can affect interest rates in the United States and valuations in the United States. So on the margin, what we've seen recently just increases these risks we've just been talking about, more pressure on inflation, more pressure on valuations, and unfortunately, slightly higher recession risk as well. Ben, I know your teams at Goldman are, are very plugged into some of the, the shorter term moves in the market. So when we come back, that first trading day of the fourth quarter, do you get any sense when you talk to people that there might be some buying, some, might, uh, some dip buying that might last more than a day? I'm not good enough to tell you what will happen on a day-to-day -day basis, but I can tell you what we're talking about with investors. And that risk that we do see the market move higher in the coming quarter is very top of mind with our clients. As I said, we've seen mutual funds cut risk this year. We've seen cash balances among U.S. equity mutual funds rise very sharply. We've seen hedge funds reduce their leverage. I think that's the appropriate positioning to take when the Fed is pushing down equities, tightening financial conditions, and of course, the economy is slowing. But it does raise the risk that if the market moves higher, investors are underpositioned. And you can see this if you look at the options market as well, where skew is low. In other words, call options where investors are hedging the risk that the market goes higher are unusually expensive. So that is a major theme. It's something we're talking to clients about. But at the end of the day, what drives equity markets over the medium term is going to be Fed policy. It's going to be the economic view. And there, unfortunately, we think there's effectively a ceiling on how high the equity market can go because a major equity market rally would loosen financial conditions and be pretty antithetical to what the Fed is trying to achieve today. During any type of kind of stock market pullback or, or bear market, we've also seen 
individual investors, retail investors, they, they also look for alternative types of investments. And, and that has even led into the world of crypto as well. Do you believe that there is a certain amount of exits from the equity markets at this point in time from just the everyday investor that is going to stay in some type of alternative investment for an extended period of time and perhaps be tepid to re-enter into the equity markets? I think it's important to, to differentiate between the U.S. household, sure. which is surprisingly the single largest owner of the U.S. equity market, and the high-frequency retail trader. You know, the latter has generated a lot of headlines over the last couple of years, but is a relatively small portion of equity ownership. When we look at retail trading activity on a high frequency basis, it looks like there has been an already a major reduction in activity. You can see this in uh, trading volume data. You can see this in option data. And you can see this, for example, in a portfolio we track of the most popular retail stocks. I think these investors have by and large already moved to the back seat. The surprising thing, however, has been that households, us, our families, our friends, have really not sold equities. Actually, there's been over $100 billion of US equity ETF and mutual fund inflows this year, which is pretty surprising when the S&P is down 20%. Now, that said, those flows have slowed to a trickle in the last few weeks. And to your point, as cash yields rise towards 4%, I think the mental arithmetic is gonna be changing. And it's pretty likely that households start to withdraw some of their current equity assets. All right, we'll leave it there. Goldman Sachs Senior Strategist and Managing Director, Ben Snyder. Always good to see you. Have a good weekend. And we've also got some economic data that came out this morning. The Personal Consumption Expenditures, or PCE as you know it in your hood, price index, that coming in at a hotter than expected, up three-tenths of a percent month over month, 6.2% year over year. Core PCE also pretty hot, up 4.9% year over year. And then you've got a six-tenths of a percent month over month move. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schoenberger, who is going to break this all down for us. Jennifer, what do we need to know about this? Hey there. Good morning, Brad. That's right. The Fed's preferred measure of inflation, the personal consumption expenditures price index, as you mentioned, coming in uh, pretty hot again for August. Uh, just to reiterate some of those numbers, uh, the headline number coming in at 6.2 percent. That's up down slightly from 6.4 percent in July. Uh, but if you break that down a bit, prices for goods increased 8.6 percent. Prices for services up 5 percent. Food up 12.4% and energy prices up nearly 25% in August. Uh, if we take out the volatile food and energy categories, look at that so-called core PCE, uh, that clocked in at 4.9%. That was actually a bit hotter than the 4.7% uh, seen in July uh, on a monthly basis. That would be up six tenths of a percent. So this definitely likely to keep the Fed on its toes, raising rates to rein in inflation. And speaking of inflation, looking across the pond this morning, the European Union reporting major price increases over their consumer prices up 10 percent in the month of September. Uh, that is a record since they started keeping records back in 1997. That's two years before the euro even uh, came into being. Uh, this, of course, likely to prompt uh, both the Fed and the European Central Bank to raise rates again, guys. Jen, it's certainly also going to keep investors on their toes to kick off that fourth quarter. Uh, but I, we're also getting uh, commentary from Fed Governor uh, Lael Brainerd. What's, what is she saying so far? Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. Uh, Fed Governor Lael Brainerd speaking right now, actually, in New York, uh, reiterating that monetary policy will need to be restrictive for some time to ensure inflation is coming down and underscoring that the Fed is committed to avoiding pulling back prematurely. Now, uh, her comments coming in a speech focused on how raising rates and shrinking the balance sheet can actually have spillover effects for the rest of the world and vice versa. Uh, Brainerd noted that the Fed is closely watching the potential for any spillover effects from global central banks raising rates and the risks of uh, a financial stability there. Uh, Brainerd actually pointed to European central banks 
or European banks rather, uh, that used up their capital buffers during the pandemic and have yet to replenish that is a potential point for vulnerability. Now, I do want to underscore this coming as the UK has seen some turmoil in its government bonds over there uh, and having to reverse course and restart QE. But this speech has actually been on the books uh, for the past week for Brainerd. So these comments have been planned. Uh, so investors should really take that in stride. Uh, but anyway, again, Lael Brainerd underscoring that the Fed is committed to restrictive monetary policy, uh, which makes sense in uh, the face of these hotter PCE reads this morning. Jennifer Schumber, thanks so much. We've been hearing a lot of Fed speak following the Federal Reserve's decision to hike rates another 75 basis points this month. Today, we heard from St. Louis Fed Chief James Bullard, who says that the Fed expects more tightening this year based on the dot plot. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jen Schoenberger. Jen, you've been tracking Bullard's comments. Or what sticks out to you right now? Good morning, Brad. That's right. In an ongoing Q&A right now uh, with HSBC's global chief economist, St. Louis Fed President Bullard, saying that he's encouraged that inflation expectations are coming down. He pointed to those five-year break-evens, though he says the market can also sometimes be wrong. Uh, so uh, he says the work is, of course, not done yet. You mentioned the dot plot. He says there is uh, still more work to do uh, to maintain credibility and do this in a reasonable time frame. He also talked about QT. He says his preference is to wait and see how things develop for at least six months or longer to make sure that it's doing what the Fed thinks, which is to put upward pressure on the long end of the yield curve. Of course, these comments coming as the Bank of England uh, temporarily decided to restart its quantitative easing given turmoil in the government bond market over there, though that not seemingly impacting Fed officials thinking here in the U.S. Uh, he also mentioned again uh, that it's important not to repeat what happened uh, in the 1970s with inflation, and not just on the inflation front, but also on the economy front. There were like four recessions he pointed to during that time period, culminating in the 1982 recession. Um, to that end, he feels that the Fed really has a lot of room to hike rates here, given where the unemployment rate is. The Fed projecting 4.4% next year on unemployment. He says that really will bring um, our economy or unemployment rate back to the mean. So he is encouraged that we could still, the Fed could still um, steer the ship without creating too steep of a recession or perhaps even avoiding one. Now, separately, just want to uh, bring to your attention the Federal Reserve just coming out with some news moments ago that six of the nation's largest banks are going to participate in a pilot climate scenario analysis exercise. Basically, banks are going to be tested under different hypothetical climate scenarios to help the Fed design rules to police uh, climate change and how that could potentially impact banks and financial stability. Um, this is separate from the stress tests, I want to note. And the banks that are participating include Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo. Guys. All right, Jen, thanks very much. Appreciate it. We have just about 45 minutes to go until the close. All three of the major averages pushing firmly higher here. The Dow now up 561 points. The move higher in equity is coming as Treasury and UK bond yields do drop. The move coming after Bank of, Bank of England's intervention in the bond market. Let's talk about what this means for U.S. investors in the U.S. markets. We want to bring in Christina Hooper joining us in studio, Invesco's chief global market strategist. Christina, it's great to see you. So we're seeing this reaction play out in the U.S. markets today. But what do you make of the Bank of England's decision to intervene in the bond market? Well, I think it was probably the best of a limited set of options. And I think that certainly for the time being, um, it's been a positive for risk assets. Um, certainly this to me uh, reminds me of Mario Draghi's words about a decade ago when he said, you know, by many any means necessary, we're going to be supporting the euro. I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. um, and and that's what we heard today. You know, at, at any scale necessary, we're we're going to be buying. So um, that to me is is a, a big um, signal that there there's going to be support there. You say for the time being, uh, does this change the inevitable future that's ahead in the UK economically? 
I don't know the answer to that. Um, it remains to be written, um, but but certainly, at least for the time being, this is this is a good sign. And you know, who knows what the future holds in terms of amending uh, this mini budget? All kinds of things could happen. Um, but at least for now, the freefall that that was uh, occurring has has been stopped. And Christina, Rochelle here, in terms of the, the contagion, we usually tend to see central banks sort of moving in concert. Not the case right now. A lot of different dynamics going on within economies. What should people be keeping an eye on in terms of how what's happening in the UK will affect what's happening with the US? Well, even the UK, the Bank of England is moving at, at essentially cross purposes because you have this uh, QE ongoing um, or a QE that, that um, is has been um, started just now, but you also have rate hikes potentially in the off offing, quantitative tightening in the offing, so it's creating just a high level of confusion. We don't have that with other central banks um, in that there's just one move, and that is towards a tightening monetary policy. So it's, it's a lot more complicated in the UK, but I'd also argue that in the Eurozone, there are some complications as well. Again, this is a vulnerable economy like the UK. Uh, there are some forms of fiscal support, certainly not the kind of massive tax cuts we've, we've seen offered in this mini budget, but, but certainly some forms of fiscal stimulus in the Eurozone as well. Because um, let's face it, um, neither one of these two central banks can solve for some of the major sources of inflation impacting those economies, um, because a lot of it's coming from, for example, energy prices. So uh, it, it's a difficult situation, and, and um, it, it's far more complicated. Christina, what about potential uh, intervention in the currency market? We saw Japan do it just a few days ago. When you look back to last week, do you think that's potentially on the table in the UK? Uh, I don't think so, just because um, the, the, the UK doesn't own a lot of, of reserves. Uh, it's just in a very, very different position than, than Japan is. And so I don't think that's the way, um, I don't think they can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I think with, again, a limited set of options, they chose perhaps the best, um, the best way to approach what is a crisis. Back here at home, quite a rally on this news as we saw the market surge. Um, about the same time earlier today, we heard from Stanley Druckenmiller, who says he'd be stunned if there's not a recession uh, by the end of 23 and not surprised if it's larger than the so-called garden average variety. Your thoughts on that dire prediction here? I think it's too early to say that. Um, certainly the Fed seems to be driving towards a significant recession. Um, but I still think there's time for the Fed to um, change course. Um, when you're hiking rates at 75 basis point chunks and you're not taking the time to assess, you're not really being data dependent, even though you pledge to be, that's a real problem. Um, but having said that, the economy is in rather good shape. We're seeing um, corporate debt levels relatively low. Um, we're seeing uh, very low unemployment. So there are a lot of good things about this economy. And so I think that if the Fed were to pivot soon, um, we could avoid that significant recession. Do you, do you think too much too fast from the Fed? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Oh, yeah. They think 75 is the new 25, and, and that's just not working. Michelle? And it's interesting because obviously we heard from Powell who was saying that we shouldn't get used to these, these big bumper hikes every time, but some estimates are saying perhaps 75 for the next hike and then 50 after that. What is your take? How do you think it's going to go from here? Well, I'm hoping that the Fed has some time to assess the kind of impact it's already had. I and mean, we understand that there is a lag, and, and I think they do too, that there's a lag, and so we're not going to see all the impact. And of course, we have all these central banks tightening right now. Um, so there's, there's a global effect there as well, a global slowdown. Um, so I'm hoping that the next rate hike is 50 basis points, and perhaps the next one after that is 25 basis points. They need to be more measured. Um, this is akin to getting in the shower in the morning. You get cold water, so your automatic reaction is turn the dial in all the in the opposite direction. You can get scalded, and that's what the Fed is doing to us. We need to calibrate. Christina, real quick, if we do see two 50 uh, point hikes before the end of the year, what's going to be the, uh, the market's reaction? Do you think? Do you think we're going to drop once again below those June lows? Well, the stock market, uh, well, the expectations right now are probably still around 125 beeps. So if we get anything less than that, I think there will be a positive reaction there. And especially if we get some signs, 
anything of, of a pivot. Um, we didn't get anything from Powell at last week's meeting. So I think, uh, I think markets, risk assets want to rise. Um, and it's just a matter of finding some kernel of optimism coming from the Fed. All right, inflation still near a 40 year high here in the United States. Everything we do, everything we eat, as you know, costs dramatically more these days. And as a result, we're all working more or at least looking to work more in order to make ends meet and maintain our lifestyles. And with that, a staggering number, nearly 70 percent of Americans said they're seeking additional work to combat inflation. That's according to a new survey by Blue Crew, a workforce as a service platform. Also, nearly six in 10 Americans said they're currently looking for or are interested in short term gig work. That is an astounding number. If you'd have told me that number was at 25 or 30 percent, I'd have said, Shauna, that is extraordinarily high. 70 percent of Americans gives you a real accurate picture of how difficult things are right now and why perhaps the Fed believes they have to do whatever they can to bring that inflation down, even that it means a million to a million and a half people losing a job. CNN in a separate survey with Bank of America showed 70 plus percent of people say inflation is eating up anything they're earning at work. They're not getting a quick enough raise. It is difficult. It is me. very difficult. These numbers stuck out to me, too. I also think it's even more concerning when you take into account what the Fed is trying to do as it tries to get inflation under control. More people, like you just said, could be out of a job. So if, these, so if so many people are already feeling the financial strain right now, it could potentially get much, much worse here as the Fed does try to do all it can to rein in inflation. A couple of other numbers that stuck out to me here in that survey. 85% of Americans saying that inflation has impacted their recent spending and also their buying habits. I don't think that should come as a big surprise given the fact that so many are already looking for more hours or second jobs in order to deal with higher inflation. 72% saying that inflation has impacted the view of their job. 57% saying that they have sought out new or additional roles over the past year due to the rising cost of living. That just reaffirms the situation that millions of Americans are in right now, how it's so tough when you look at Every, almost everything you buy on a daily basis has risen in price compared to last year. And Rochelle, taking a look at these numbers, so many Americans looking to add on hours, looking to take on a second job, really just paints the exact picture of the current economic picture right now. No, it really does. And when you think of how we're trying to look at the labor picture, then when you have people working a job, but then also perhaps taking on some of these seasonal jobs, it might muddy the, the economic picture when you're trying to figure out how the labor market is actually doing. If there's two open jobs for one person, but people are then yeah. taking on a second job, obviously it makes it more difficult to calculate. And as we look at some of the things that people consider their priorities pre-pandemic versus now, wages and pay, 57% prioritize that. Work-life balance, though, right behind it at 56%, then that even superseded benefits at 55%. And that even overtook things like schedule flexibility or enjoying what you do. And sadly, over prioritizing your mental health. So people really having to make some very tough decisions and making some really big sacrifices that hopefully don't end up yeah. becoming too costly. But it's obviously a very tough space for people right now. It's a, it's a good reality check to know that mm -hmm. you out there watching us, you're, I'm right there with you. 70% that would work more or take on a side gig to pay the bills. I'm with you, friends. All right. And to continue the market conversation, let's bring in Kamal Shri Kumar, uh, president and founder of Shri Kumar Global Strategies. Kamal, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you had um, you had wanted the Fed to have uh, to increase rates by 125 basis points. Tell us, were you disappointed that the Fed did not raise uh, rates by 125 basis points? And do you think that in the next uh, meeting they should, and why? Uh, you have several questions there. Uh, let me start going uh, one after the other. Yes, I am disappointed they did not raise by 125 basis points at the last meeting. I did not really expect them to because in my mind, this is a relatively dovish Fed. So I had banked on about 75 basis points, which is what I got. The advantage of 125 basis points would have been that, that that would have put the Fed way ahead of the market, ahead of the curve, and thereafter they will not have to do very much. This way around, they increased it by 75. The market is expecting another 75 in November. 
and the market will keep expecting that for a few more meetings. So in other words, by going so gradually, they are going to increase even more than they would have had they given a one big move in uh, last month. Uh, Shree, with that said, you know, we're just talking about the comments that we got from Chicago Fed President Charles Evans today about the concerns that many others have raised about moving too aggressively and too soon. Obviously, you weren't anticipating the 125 basis points. That's what you said they should be doing. But how big exactly. of a risk is that factor in terms of going too quickly when we haven't necessarily seen the Fed policy or at least the intended impact of it take hold yet? The question is what we all mean by risk there, Akiko. And if you are talking about the risk of a recession, that risk is clearly there. There is nothing the Fed can do about it. They should have thought about it last year in 2021 when they were <laughs> calling the inflation transitory. I wrote every month, every possible opportunity that they are totally wrong. Jerome Powell was out to lunch and this inflation was going to be high and sustained. Having made a mistake there, having kept interest rates very low for too long a period of time, and even after he decided last November that inflation was not transitory, recall that the Fed did not start tightening until March of this year. Why did they wait another four or five months? They made the situation much worse. They are talking about home prices and Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen was talking about high home prices, putting them beyond the reach of first time buyers. At the same time, the Federal Reserve was pushing up home prices by buying agency mortgage backed securities. It is just incomprehensible to me. Do they have a big risk? Yes. Will there be a recession? Yes, it will also be a stagflation because we are going to have a combination of recession with persistent high inflation rates like we did not see in the 1970s. So there is nothing the Fed can do. They can't reverse policy. Uh, if they want, they can go back in the time machine and probably go back 15 months and change the picture. Shri, can you give us a sense of what the impacts of these rate hikes will have on institutions, on companies that are loaded with debt. I mean, the government has so much debt. It is such a different environment than the, the Paul Volcker environment, Paul Volcker being uh, the uh, Fed chairman that uh, uh, Chairman uh, Powell has referenced so many times. Uh, you are absolutely correct. There is a lot more debt today than we had in the 1970s, and that's going to make the situation much more difficult to handle both for the US Treasury and for large corporations. What I think that would lead to is the fact that with the passage of time, you're going to have one or a few large companies which are unable to service obligations. And that in turn is going to cause what we say, quote unquote, credit even, meaning somebody cannot repay their debt, they default, and that in turn causes the Fed to switch. So if you are looking for interest rate increases to come to an end or to slow down, one way to do it is to have a credit event and the Fed reacts to it by saying, now our job is to save the system. Think about 1998 with the long-term capital management, which unexpectedly collapsed in the aftermath of higher interest rates earlier in the decade. Think about 2008 when Lehman Brothers went down and in each case, the monetary policy shifted to easing. And that is one of my scenarios as a possibility for the future. Another scenario would be that the very strong dollar in turn causes new issues of its own because the strong dollar leads to, typically leads to financing issues. And if that happens, and if you have a coordinated manner of supporting the dollar like we did with the Plaza Accord in 1985, that will be a turnaround in policy as well. So you need accidents to change it. You're not, it's not going to happen with the normal course of time. Uh, finally, Shri, while we're talking about the Fed right now, obviously we're in a global uh, higher rate environment. A lot of focus being placed on the Bank of England given what has played out over the last few days, the huge swing that we've seen in the pound, 
also on the back of these tax cuts that have been proposed by this new administration. Um, where do you think the BOE moves from here? And what is the risk of contagion of a misstep spilling across borders? Uh, your first question first, what do I think the Bank of England is going to do? They have already told us they are not going to do anything before the November meeting. And that is way too late. So what I expect is that you will again, even though today is a day of relative peace, both for the pound sterling as well as for UK bond yields, uh, this peace is not going to last. This calm is not going to last too long. We are going to have one more turbulent move, if not more, and I am expecting an emergency rate hike on the part of the Bank of England. The risk of doing that is the following. If they raise interest rates by 100, 150 basis points, uh, that in turn has to work to support the pound, but more often than not in various countries, especially in developing economies, it gives rise to a new run on the currency. So people decide the government is very concerned about it. They are going to increase interest rates. So rather than buy pound sterling, I'm going to sell them. So that, I think, is what uh, is the big risk. In terms of the policy itself, Akiko, I think the Bank of England and the Chancellor of the Exchequer have been working at cross purposes with each other. You almost wonder whether they belong to the same government or not. Hmm. Earlier in the week, the Bank of England increased the interest rate by 50 basis points. And on Friday, the Chancellor of the Exchequer offset that with huge tax cuts. You cannot have one entity trying to cut aggregate demand when the other entity is trying to increase it. Yeah. That's going to end up in mass confusion. And that's what we saw take place Friday. And over the weekend, the Chancellor talked about further increases uh, in terms of fiscal stimulus, possibly yeah. cutting uh, taxes further. And you saw what happened yesterday. We had a renewed fall in the pound. Uh, so that's where we are. Translation, more volatility to come. Uh, Kamal more Shri Kumar, president and founder of Shri Kumar Global Strategies. Appreciate your time. Good to have you on today. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live, everyone. Major averages holding on to gains this morning after the Dow finished yesterday's trading session in a bear market as concerns surrounding the world economy takes center stage. For more on the latest market action and sentiment, we've got Kevin Gordon, Charles Schwab, Senior Investment Research Manager. Kevin, thanks for joining us in studio, live in living color this morning. You say that investors don't need to wait for the Fed to break something. Break that down for us. Well, I think if you look at the housing market, it's, it's already happening. I um, mean, you kind of have to break it down in the different phases that you tend to see with weakness in housing, starting on the sentiment side. So something like the NAHB, um, you know, housing you know, home builder sentiment um, has deteriorated rapidly. And if you look at rates of change within whether the headline index itself or prospective buyers traffic, that is firmly recessionary. And it's starting to wade into other areas like home sales, new home sales, existing home sales have been basically cut in half from their peak. And now you're starting to see it creep a little bit into prices, but we haven't gotten there yet. And that is the part that's the issue really for inflation and ultimately for the Fed and the broader economy, because they're looking at that not coming down as rapidly, feeding into higher rental inflation that's going to be a little bit stickier later. Um, but if you want to look for something that's breaking, I would say it's already happening in the sentiment components of, of housing itself. Yeah, we just got um, house price numbers, but they're for July, so it's trailing. We get new home sales out at 10 a.m. Um, talk to us about how we should think about, like, I mean, we know why housing is important, but sort of put it together for us. And uh, when we look at home ownership rates in the United States, mm -hmm. et cetera, why is it such an important thing to look at for the status of the overall economy? Well, the ripple effects from housing are, are massive, um, you know, not just from a confidence angle, but also when you think about affordability, the fact that, you know, monthly payments have gone up significantly for homeowners. But also, you know, the, the potential entry into the home market has, has completely almost been shut for would-be home buyers because of the spike in mortgage rates, because home prices have taken longer to come down. Um, so I think that, you know, in terms of slowing down the economy, you could do it pretty effectively. Um, uh, but it also, in a good sense, I would say that the positive spin on the, the housing bubble this time, more so the price bubble, not anything akin to what we saw in 05, 06, is that you don't have high you know, debt service to income mm -hmm. ratio. You don't have high household you know, um, debt relative to income. So that is the positive aspect this time. But for the Fed and them wanting to sort of stem any of the inflationary pressures and keep it you know, at bay, um, that's 
largely been successful, but we have to now see it and wait for it to feed into lower price growth over into the future. Kevin, uh, investors waking up today, they're, they're awakening, awakening to see all three major indices in a bear market. And investors have been largely taught that investing in, in something that tracks these indexes is the best way to go. But is that broken? Does that still work? Should investors be more now pivoting to stock picking, especially given the pullbacks we've seen, like in tech, for example? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've been in favor of a little bit more of an active approach as the bear markets progress this year. The only rub with it now is that correlations have picked up a lot. So it's if, you're, if your entry point is around now, um, which I wouldn't argue ever for a get in or a get out strategy, but if your entry point has gotten a little bit closer to, to the near term, it's a little bit tougher to do that. But there are still factors that work. And I know last time I was here, we talked about screening for high quality, specifically earnings quality. And that has been actually the key outperformer, not just the past three months, six months, um, or year to date for the past year. That's been where you've been able to find consistent outperformance across every sector. How do you know it's quality? Like what, what defines quality in yeah. an environment that with GDP is, is barely growing? Anything with earnings strength, whether it's trailing profit margin growth or forward estimated profit margin growth. And specifically, you know, the market's going to put a premium on whatever is scarce. So if you look at the percentage of companies in the S&P, for example, that have positive earnings revisions that have had them over the past three months, it's only 30 percent. That's, you know, down from about 90 uh, a year ago. So that rapid deterioration has elevated the companies that have done really well from that earnings profit margin, uh, you know, forward looking perspective. What about on the employment front and particularly on the unemployment side, what we've been hearing is that even if we're looking quarter over quarter now and, and actually a year out from now, thinking about when the deepest components of a recession might hit, what unemployment may actually look like at that point in time, uh, what would you be tracking most notably going into that period too? Well, in the leading sense, claims for sure. I um, mean, the good, on the, you know, the good aspect of that from the consumer or the, em the, the employee perspective is that claims have started to roll over. So we've reclaimed almost half of that spike that we've seen since April, which is great. Not so great from the Fed's perspective because that just signals that company demand has actually been relatively strong if people been able, have been able to find jobs at a quicker pace. But moving more into the coincident areas like non-farm payrolls, even within that, non-farm payroll growth still looks pretty strong. But if you look at something like the household survey, they both diverged. Mm -hmm. Household survey has been relatively flat. Non-farm payroll survey uh, has still been strong. And then, you know, in a lagging sense, the unemployment rate, which we would never look at for you know any sort of leading indication as to where the economy is going. Um, but implicit in the Fed's forecast, you sort of bring up where unemployment can go is a 4.4 percent unemployment rate by next year. That's a 0.7 percent jump from where we're at right now. That is, you know, that's a recessionary type jump when you look back at history, um, you know, for the trough in the unemployment rate to the start of a recession. So I just think from our broader perspective and all of us at Schwab, it's really tough to thread that needle mm -hmm. and to sort of get this immaculate scenario where you have GDP just sub, you know, trend growth with unemployment rising a little bit and inflation coming back down. Um, one of those sort of has to break and, and not really work. I mean, I would argue that probably unemployment once it's out of the bag, it's it's really hard to get back in. Well, there's a lot of stuff breaking out there. But uh, Kevin Gordon, good to see you in, Thanks, in the flesh. Uh, appreciate you. you coming down. These are busy times. Charles Schwab, Senior Investment Research Manager. Good to see you. And as Saz mentioned, we're continuing to hear from a slew of Fed speakers this week after Fed Presidents Charles Evans, Susan Collins, Raphael Bostic, Loretta Mester. They already spoke, signaling the Fed will continue to prioritize pushing back against inflation. We also heard from Jay Powell, specifically with regard to crypto. Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomberger has her hands full, covering all of that commentary. What stands out, Jen? Good morning, Julie. That's right. After that blackout period ended and the Fed hiked rates last week, uh, Fed officials are out in droves speaking over the past 48 hours, underscoring their resolve to fight inflation. Uh, we heard from Chicago Fed uh, President Charles Evans this morning. He says the Fed needs to raise interest rates by at least another percentage point this year, a more aggressive stance than previously embraced. Evans also said he does not see, quote, recession-like unemployment rate numbers ahead, even as the Fed sees the unemployment rate rising to 4.4 percent next year, uh, a jump from current levels that some economists say could usher in a recession. Now, we also heard from Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, who says that the Fed should raise rates higher and keep policy restrictive for some time since inflation is, quote, unacceptably high. She underscored it's better that the Fed err on the side of doing more rather than doing less, even if that means a policy error, i.e. potentially a recession. We also heard from Susan Collins, 
The new president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, in her first comments since taking that post, uh, she says that she's committed to bringing inflation down to 2% and supporting higher interest rates that we saw the FOMC put forth last week. Uh, she also says that that's fine, even if that means that the economy slows. Now, elsewhere, as you mentioned, we heard from Fed Chair Powell this morning, who was participating virtually in a conference put on by the Bank of France on regulating crypto. Powell said there's a real need for regulation as DeFi expands. And he says, while some crypto resembles traditional financial banking activities and could be regulated using traditional banking regulations, other aspects are more novel. And uh, he pointed specifically to replacing intermediaries with smart contracts and that that would require perhaps uh, different sorts of regulation. Now, the Fed chair also weighing in again on a CBDC. He reiterated that no decision has been made and there probably won't be a decision for some time. He said it's going to take a couple of years, actually, before the Fed can solidify its analysis and conclusion. And Guys? Jen, while we have you later on today, actually just after the trading session kicks off, we're going to be set to hear from the St. Louis Fed president, James Bullard, what signal could could he strike different from what we've already heard uh, from other Fed presidents and especially as Bullard has been known to be more hawkish, more aggressive over the past rate decisions as well? Yeah, I mean, it was a unanimous decision um, as far as um, the 75 basis point rate hike last week. But I do expect him to come out um, quite hawkish. Um, you know, the latest numbers we've seen on inflation, particularly that CPI number, was quite hot. Um, and so it seems that the Fed still needs to do a lot of work here. So I would expect him to be uh, quite hawkish. You know, will he say, hey, yeah, we could have gone 100 basis points? I mean, I don't know. It remains to be seen, but certainly we'll be keeping a close eye on that. Whether it's hey, yeah, or hey, yeah, we're going to be <laughs> paying close attention to whatever St. Louis Fed President James Bullard says. We appreciate the breakdown here this morning, Jen. We'll check in later. Better news, I guess, depends how you look at it, but it is National Pancake Day. And we're taking a look at how inflation, though, has impacted some of the food items in your kitchen. Key ingredients in pancakes include eggs, flour, milk, and butter. And you can see the August price tags of these items from the Bureau of Labor Statistics there on your screen. But if you compare what we're seeing today's prices to what we saw pre-pandemic levels, it certainly is a bit of a shift. So milk up just about 37%, eggs up 155%, Butter up about 16%, flour up 22% on average. Rochelle, you and I have talked time and time again how inflation is impacting millions and millions of Americans, every single American living here in the U.S., higher food prices, even hitting some of our breakfast staples. I mean, 155% on eggs. That is... That is, that is mind boggling. But you know, I mean, National Pancake Day, it's, it's meant to be a, a celebration of all things, you know, delicious and buttery. Although, you know, we've been hearing about potential butter shortages as well. Um, I, I mean, I'm still gonna be making my pancakes. You know, I think everybody could do with a bit of cheering up right now. Maybe, maybe a little less egg or something, try, <laughs> try and stretch it out a little bit. But in terms of toppings though, I like, it's like Nutella, mm -hmm. bananas, or I'm going to do simple it's with like good. Some lemon it's good. and a little bit of brown and sugar. And pancakes right now are my three-year-old's favorite. So I haven't been making too many. My mom makes a lot of pancakes for him, but I need to start making more. I don't know. These prices scare me a little bit, but you're right. They're so good. They're hard to give up. But you know, I, make, I make them for my daughter pretty much every single day. Wow. Like that's her thing. That's she gets impressive, her bacon, Michelle. her turkey sausage. Yeah, I think I'm doing too much, frankly. You are. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. But of course, be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. I'm Rochelle Kufa, along with Shauna Smith. We'll see you then. Joining us now for more on the latest economic picture following the Fed's latest hawkish messaging, we've got Matthew Luzzetti, who's the Deutsche Bank Securities, uh, <laughs> Deutsche Bank Securities Chief U.S. Economist. Excuse me, Matthew. Great to have you here with us this morning. For First and foremost, coming off of last week and the decision that was widely expected from the Fed, I guess the big question is, where do we go from here in the Fed's pathway from your perspective? Sure. First, thanks so much for having me. I think what we got from Chair Powell last week was a decidedly hawkish message. The Fed delivered another 75 basis point rate increase. Uh, they signaled we think that another 75 basis point hike is likely in November. 
Uh, we think that they raise the Fed funds rate to 5% early next year. And it really is a central bank that is focused on the incoming inflation data. And I think the message from Powell was that is the number one thing for them. Uh, they will risk a recession if that is what is needed in order to get inflation down. Ultimately, we think that is what will be needed and that a recession happens by the middle of next year. But it really, I think, from a, the Fed's perspective, they need to get inflation pressures down. They need to have very clear and convincing evidence that, that inflation is back on a, a path down towards their target in order to pivot at some point to a more dovish messaging. Uh, but ultimately, we don't think that that's happening this year. We think it's a story for next year once a recession uh, and those dynamics are, are far clearer. Matt, we got some commentary or, or speak, I believe it was on Friday from, from Jay Powell, saying that we might be heading into a new economic normal. What does that look like in your estimation and how long might it last? Sure. So I think we, we have two things to focus on from the Fed's perspective. It's, it's the near term. How do they deal, deal with high inflation, a very tight labor market? And how do they get inflation back down closer to 2%? That dynamic, we think, ultimately works its way out with a recession, with the Fed tightening very aggressively over the next several months, the economy turning down in the middle of next year, the unemployment rate probably rising to somewhere between 55 and 6%. And then I think there's a second question, which is, what does this economy look like structurally after we get you know, past that recession and inflation comes back down? I, I think we do know a few things. One, inflation is just likely to be structurally higher. Uh, deglobalization and aging population, some of these climate change policies are all likely to be uh, supportive from an inflationary perspective. I think one thing that the economy is also currently dealing with uh, is not enough labor supply. Um, it's a key driver of high wage growth. You see firms that still need to find workers, job openings are near record high levels. And I think those two things together tell you uh, potential growth in the economy is likely lower going forward and structural inflation is likely to be higher going forward. Now, within your uh, modeling for the U.S. economy, how dire does it get in the U.S. housing market? We've seen rates really climb here. It's starting to impact home values, existing home sales, new home sales. Are, uh, how bad could things look? Yeah, I think what you've seen, given the, the surge in mortgage rates, the, the collapse in housing affordability, is that uh, we should still see very negative growth in the housing market over the coming quarters. We think residential investment is almost down 30% uh, annualized in the most recent quarter. Uh, but given the leads that we have from housing affordability, that, that should continue. I think underlying that, there is some interesting dynamics, though. We got uh, housing starts last week. And within that, multifamily housing starts actually hit a cycle high. And so I think you're, what you're seeing is this shift away from uh, single family uh, homes for purchase towards uh, multifamily houses for rent. And it is a signal, I think, that you have a, a housing market in the US economy that is structurally undersupplied. And so there will be a negative impact near term given what's happened with mortgage rates and housing affordability. But the longer term story on housing, I think, is actually a, a positive one from, from an investment perspective, given that we are structurally undersupplied. Matt, in previewing this earnings season, in a couple of weeks, we're going to hear from banks and they're really going to be setting the tone, perhaps, for what consumers, what businesses, small businesses, larger businesses, uh, and even deal making at a whole. Uh, we've got a few things that they're going to be able to signal about the state of the economy. What do you expect them to really lay out and, and to kick off not just earnings season, but kind of the mindset economically right now? Yeah, I think you have, and, and we see this in the surveys, whether it's the, the PMIs last week, the ISMs, uh, it's an economy where I think you still are under uh, supplied in terms of labor. And so firms still have uh, supply constraints, particularly on the employment side. Uh, the global supply constraints that we were all worried about before, a lot of those are, are dissipating. Commodity prices are, are clearly coming off. But the price pressures now, I think, are coming through wages and the difficulty to find labor. I just think that there's there's massive amounts of uncertainty about the outlook at this point, uh, how much the Fed will have to tighten policy, the knock-on effects from that to financial conditions, and ultimately the economy. And so I think you should hear from firms that, you know, despite the fact that demand today looks uh, still pretty solid and resilient, the labor market still looks solid and resilient, that the outlook over the ne next 12 months is, is highly uncertain. Uh, and so the firms you know, have to begin to think about what do their plans look like uh, if a recession hits over the next 12 months. We, we still think it happens by the middle of next year, but even the timing of that I think is highly uncertain uh, and will be dictated by what happens with near-term inflation data and how aggressive does the Fed have to tighten policy. We continue to be locked in on all, thing, all things currency markets, Matt. Uh, the, the U.S. dollar at a, what, 20-year high at just uh, levels not many folks have seen before. What impact will that have on the U.S. economy? It, it should help the Fed in many ways. Uh, it helps to tighten financial conditions. It makes exports from the U.S. more expensive, so it helps to reduce growth through that channel. Importantly, it should help to bring down inflationary pressures. Um, but most of the goods inflationary pressures we've seen have been on the supply side and supply constraints. 
So I think it is something that helps the Fed, uh, but I think the Fed needs a lot more help than that. They, they really need tight financial conditions. They need that through real yields uh, moving to, to even higher levels. I think they need equity markets to, to be lower. They need credit spreads to be wider. And I think this is over the past several months, you know, the Fed gave a message at the July FOMC meeting. The market responded by really easing financial conditions. And I think we, we that triggered the Fed's eventual more hawkish response from Chair Powell over the past several uh, months, particularly at Jackson Hole in the most recent meeting. He's really giving no dovish signals at all. And I think that's because the Fed knows that they need tight financial conditions. It'll come through a number of channels. The currency one is, is certainly one of them. But I think the Fed also needs to see tightening come through equity markets as we're beginning to see a little bit, but also wider credit spreads. Matt, we're, we're seeing discretionary names in the equities market right now. Get, get a little bit of nibbling action as we kick off today's trading session and this week's trading. Do you believe that with indiscretionary, there are some more resilient pockets than others that are perhaps not as directly impacted by either inventory or supply chain concerns as others, because those are things that are definitely out of the Fed's uh, jurisdiction, if you will. Yeah, I think you have an economy that is is has multiple phases going on here. We, we talked about the housing market and and um, you know some of the collapse in activity that we've seen there. On the good side, outside of autos, uh, you, you certainly have some some uh, inventory pickup issues that have taken place. We haven't seen that show up in the CPI data in terms of price discounts yet, but I anticipate that that will come. On the other side, you have uh, the auto sector that still looks supply constrained, very meaningful price pressures, likely have pent up demand there. Uh, and within the services sector, uh, you have an economy that still, I think, is, is running hot in many ways. You have pent up demand. You still are below the pre-COVID trend in, in terms of spending in that sector. You have difficulty finding labor. Uh, and so that is, I think, leading to persistent inflationary and wage pressures within the services sector, but also an area where we should see uh, a meaning, meaningful pickup in activity. The, the other thing that I would mention is that you know, gas prices surged earlier this year. I think that was a really important drag on uh, economic activity, particularly through consumer spending. We should not discount how important that is for consumer spending on the other side. As gas prices come, come down, that helps to lift uh, consumer confidence and should help to lift disposable income in other sectors and ultimately spending in other sectors. Yeah, I think all those savings over the weekend at the gas pump, Matt, I went out and bought myself a sandwich because why the heck not? Matthew Lozetti, Deutsche Bank Securities Chief U.S. Economist. Always good to see you. Talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. We want to bring back in Brad McMillan of Commonwealth Financial. Brad, let's just start with what Jared was talking about with the strong U.S. dollar. Now, while Powell was speaking, we did see the dollar spike higher here, still holding on to gains today. But the strong U.S. dollar, just what is your assessment for how big of a challenge this poses to U.S. equities in the second half of the year and then looking ahead to 2023? Yeah, I think when you look at this, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is the reason the dollar is stronger compared to international concerns, currencies is simply we've done more to get inflation under control. It's not showing up yet, but from a policy perspective, we're on top of things. I think that was an absolutely correct statement. So while at the same time, we're getting a challenge from the U.S. dollar, for example, sales abroad and foreign currencies are going to scale back into the U.S. at a reduced value. Nonetheless, we also get some advantages on input costs, especially for raw materials. And because we are managing inflation better, I think net net, it's going to be pretty much neutral. And most of the arguments you get that it's going to be a headwind are based on those earnings effects. But I think they're going to be offset by some of the other positives that we're seeing. And as you address this sort of simultaneous global tightening that you're seeing with other central bankers, are there any sort of outliers that you think could put additional pressure on the U.S. economy more so than they already are? I think the big worry out there is energy prices. I mean, what we've seen in the improvement in the headline inflation index was largely due to energy and gas prices. But then today, we didn't quite make it to 100 days in a row where we saw declining gas prices. They actually ticked up a bit. And the question is, how much of that energy, the oil price decline, is due to the release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? So right now, I think energy is probably the biggest threat to what we're to the progress we've made on inflation and the biggest upside risk. I think for housing, which is the other probably the biggest risk, is we're probably looking at that for another six to 12 months. But even there, we can see the data starting to roll over. So I think energy is the big thing I'm watching at the moment. Yeah, strategic petroleum reserve now at levels not seen since 1984. We don't hear a lot about that. Uh, Andrew Levin earlier told us he believes 
Inflation will still continue to climb in the months ahead. And even Powell himself admitted that shelter inflation will remain high for, quote, some time. And it was really sticky in that last print. When do you think inflation will begin to subside? I think I would say probably around the first quarter of next year. When you look at shelter, that was the real surprise in the last inflation report. And the reason I say that is because everything else came out pretty much as expected, but shelter came in twice what it was. And when you look at the relationship of shelter inflation to housing prices, there's typically about a 15 month lag. So shelter is gonna to continue to be a major part and a major pressure on inflation, certainly through the rest of this year and probably through the first quarter of next year. The question is going to be, do we get enough of a pullback in everything else? And I think we're certainly going to mitigate inflation. Goods inflation in particular has started to come back as the supply curve, is supply chain has healed. But we're probably going to see increasing, but more slowly increasing inflation, at least through the end of the year. We do thank you for joining us this afternoon with your insights. Commonwealth Financial Network CIO Brad McMillan, thank you so much. In times of uncertainty, investors typically turn to gold, and there were certainly some flows to the precious metal this morning. This as the Fed looks to proceed with another 75 basis point hike and amid the ongoing war in Ukraine. So what's the best way to play it? Wallach Beth Capital's director of ETF Trading Solutions, Mohit Bajaj, joins us now. And Mohit, the big question for gold is, why hasn't it performed better? Year to date, it is down almost 7%. You could argue that it's done much better than other assets. But really, why hasn't oil uh, gone to the moon, let's say, for uh, uh, gold, gold bugs? I think what's happening this year is that historically gold has been an inflation hedge or considered an inflation hedge. But with uh, uncertainty with the central banks, uh, inflation now, what, at eight, eight and a half percent almost, right? We haven't seen this type of inflation since the 1970s. Uh, people are a little more hesitant in getting into gold. And two, it hasn't performed as well as it historically has, right? Um, just because we've seen this huge spike in inflation and concerns with interest rates, um, gold usually it performs pretty statically when inflation is is doesn't move as much or interest rates are more flatlined. But what we've seen this huge spike now with rates and inflation at the same time, which we haven't seen in 40 years, uh, gold hasn't proven to be its uh, historically uh, inflation-proof product or that just people hoped it would be. I mean, just the safe haven play that it traditionally has been. You know, we've seen the move today on the back of what's been playing out in Russia, but as you said, it hasn't really tracked with how it's historically been traded. We'll get to how you can actually trade gold, but I wonder when you talk about prices, how much of what we've seen so far has to do with what's been playing out in China and India? It's become a huge part of it. So unfortunately with China, it's, uh, we, they're still under COVID restriction. So what's happening now is that usually China is a big consumer of gold products, so is India. So when China's on lockdown, not many people are actually physically buying the product. Um, what needs to happen essentially in those countries is that there needs to be more uh, open marketness. People need to go out and start shopping. And that hasn't been happening. So that's been kind of creating an excess surplus in the marketplace and why gold prices haven't been lifted since. How much gold do you think that investors should have in their portfolio? I'm, I'm a big proponent of always uh, allocating across the board in all sorts of different um, asset classes. Anywhere from 5 to 10% should be no more than, uh, you know, significant in one's portfolio. Obviously, you don't want to be overweighted in any asset class, right, or sector for that matter. Uh, but having a, anywhere from a 5 to 10% weighting in your portfolio, I think, would be more than sufficient. So where are you seeing the inflows right now when you talk about ETF products that are market that allow investors to trade in gold? Well, uh, there's a couple of products that are out there that are all fine products. Uh, GLD is one of them. Uh, it's the, it was the first ETF in the marketplace to actually track gold. Um, it's about 50 billion in assets, so it's if you want to get access to gold without having to physically buy the, buy the metal, you can just buy that ETF. Uh, BAR is another one that we've seen a lot of uh, strong demand in. One of the reasons why it's become so popular is it's actually become a lower expense fee play. And from a price standpoint, it's only like $16 or $17. So for those who are novice investors and just want to kind of set their 
put their foot into the into the space, they can buy that without having to expel as much capital. And would you recommend physical gold? Um, I think it's the problem with having physical gold is that if you want to sell it, you might it's going to be a little bit tougher, right? Um, it's getting the liquidity, buying it, storing it, um, and even getting out of it is always problematic. That's why it's much easier to uh, have the ETF where you can basically get liquidity anytime you want to get get out. Okay, some good investing advice there, Mohit Bajaj. Well, look, Beth, Capital's Director of ETF Trading Solutions. Appreciate your time today. And as we continue to look towards this week's FOMC meeting, our next guest says the Fed is by no means finished with its aggressive, aggressive rate policy and expects rate hikes to push forward into 2023. Let's welcome in S&P Global Chief U.S. Economist Beth Ann Bovino. Beth Ann, it's good to see you as we um, watch this sort of slight choppiness, shall we say, ahead of the FOMC decision later this week. Even as there is broad expectation that the Fed's going to continue to raise rates, there are also some who are questioning the strategy here at a time when there's concern over global growth and growth here in the U.S. and questions about whether the Fed is sort of attacking the right input of inflation by raising rates. How do you view that question? Well, I, I, the Fed has a mandate, two mandates. One is uh, managing, uh, you know, having uh, having job gains at uh, maximum, uh, I'm sorry, maximizing employment. We can say they certainly have done that. Uh, the second thing is stable inflation, and we are nowhere near that. Looking at the CPI numbers that came out last week, uh, which showed no, by no means stabilization, particularly the core CPI, which is now at uh, climbed higher and is at a uh, three times the Fed's target. So whatever mandate, whatever, whatever inflation, target you look at, uh, it's going in the wrong direction, and that's why the Fed needs to move. In terms of in terms of growth, yes, it will it will slow growth dramatically. Indeed, we see we see the uh, the risk of recession next year as a toss up. Uh, but the Fed still has to fight uh, still has to fight inflation, and I would say right now that the disease is still worse than the cure. What should consumers expect in terms of the the actual fullness of of the Fed's policy and their pathway and and the decision making? Within their hikes, what should they expect in terms of a timeline as to that being fully ingested into the economy and, and when the consumers themselves can perhaps take a breather at the Fed being done at tackling inflation? Well, I think the Fed is pushing the levers to to have the, the consumers respond. Uh, when you see these incredibly high prices, that certainly means that demand slows down. But when you add to that uh, higher interest rates, which, which also um, increases uh, borrowing costs, that's a twofold, so that you could start to see demand slowing down rather dramatically, most likely next year. We already see it in housing, as you just had mentioned. Uh, we start to, we'll start to likely see it in other areas. And when demand slows down, businesses also start to say, well, maybe we don't need as many workers. You see the unemployment rate tick up a bit. Uh, and that means the economy slows dramatically with and with that prices. But I don't think the impact is really going to be felt until sometime next year, because as, as somebody said on, on this meeting, on this call, that inflation is still around a 40 year high. It's going to take some time to get down. One of the components, though, of that, of that home builder confidence as well is supply chain issues and just being able to get the necessary inventory and able to complete some of the housing starts and projects there as well. Um, and so with all of that in mind, the, the things that are out of the Fed's control, it, are we seeing any improvement on that front? Well, we are again. It's it as you had just said uh, uh, very well. It, well, that uh, it is not in the Fed's control. The Fed uh, can't make oil, can't make cars. All they can do is slow demand, and that's their and that's their only measure that they can move. Now, in terms of supply chain disruptions, it's still a major problem. It's one of the biggest factors that are causing this uh, where we are today. Uh, we have seen some signs of softness, some signs of moderation, but nowhere near what we need to get to. That, to me, says that inflation as you ask what the Fed, what consumers are thinking and what they can hope for, I don't see inflation getting down to even close to the target, tar to the Fed's target until sometime next year or maybe even the following. So as rates go up, as we see growth start to slow, um, it feels as though, and this is something that Brad brought up earlier, that all of this is going to hit lower income households the hardest. But do you see it also starting to bite middle income, even upper middle income households as this goes on? Well, the, I guess the good news, particularly for lower income households who most of their most of their share of income goes into transport. Um, if they have a car, 
Uh, and so uh, we have seen gasoline prices moderate, still high, but come down. I believe for the last 12 weeks they've been coming down. So that will certainly help with their uh, with their purchasing power uh, in other in the other arenas. But where where other areas are being squeezed, housing. It's not just in home. It's not just in um, home sales, which we know home prices have skyrocketed. And now add to that um, get, um, now add to that uh, interest rates are also incredibly high. So that's squeezing many people out of the market. Uh, we see that about 60 percent of households are now squeezed out of the market in terms of per buying a home, not just lower income, it's going into the middle income bracket as well. But for lower income households who usually rent uh, rent homes, that now, according to HUD data, is at the worst in uh, in the history of the data that HUD tracks. So in that sense, lower income households are squeezed dramatically. It is climbing up the chain of the income strata, but right now, who gets the, the brunt? Lower income households. Beth Ann, it's always a pleasure to speak with you and, and you. really get some perspective around how the markets are digesting and anticipating what the Fed may do in their policy decision. Beth Ann Bavino, S&P Global Chief U.S. Economist, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks. Let's get on over, though, to Yahoo Finance's Inez Ferre, who's standing by at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Inez? Yeah, Brad, and as you mentioned, market slightly higher, but let's take a look at the U.S. dollar index. Yesterday, that moved up after that CPI print. Well, today, it's retreating a little bit, so this is supporting equities and commodities uh, slightly. We are looking at the sector action right now, and we're watching energy, which is really the outperformer, but I'm just going to show you a two-day chart so you can see some of the big losses that we saw in communication services, technology, uh, materials uh, over the last two days, consumer discretionary as well after that hot CPI print yesterday. Now, today we did get the PPI print, and that's the producer price index. And on a month-over-month -month basis, that fell by 0.1%. We want to show you the screen right there. And uh, this came in line with expectations. But the core PPI, that would be excluding energy and food, that came in a slightly higher than expected. What this is showing is similar to what we saw with the CPI yesterday because the CPI yesterday, that core uh, print came in hotter than expected. And a couple of reasons for this. One is because of rent and the other also, I spoke to an inflation expert who told me that he was surprised to see household furnishings and supplies going up on a month over month basis, saying that, look, given what retailers have told us over the last several months, that they have a lot of inventory, that people are spending less on discretionary items, that they're only spending on food, and energy, uh, that uh, he was surprised not to see these prices come down more because the retailers had been saying that they will be slashing prices. Two reasons maybe because of this, and I have a Yahoo Finance article coming out about this today. And one of them, according to Omar Sharif of Inflation Insights, may be because the BLS is not measuring this data properly, but he doesn't really think that may be it. He thinks it may be the, this other reason, which would be that retailers perhaps are not lowering their prices as much as that they said they would. Maybe they have their inventory in warehouses. It's not costing them that much. But this is certainly a phenomenon that we're going to keep watching over the next several months because he said that this really surprised forecasters. They have been expecting this to come, these prices in household furnishings and supplies to come down more than uh, they have. Of all these things, I keep complaining about airline prices not coming down. Mm. This is another one because I'm doing a home renovation. This is, it's painful stuff. I got to tell you, Ines, thank you for tracking it for us. Appreciate it. With seven days and counting now until the next Federal Open Market Committee meeting, investors are eyeing a 75 basis point rate hike with risk to the upside potentially. Some economists are calling for a 100 basis point rate hike following that hotter than anticipated CPI print yesterday. We did have PPI today. It wasn't as alarming, by the way, but the inflation data was a major headwind for risk assets as peak inflation talks now quiet down, at least for now. Joining us in studio to break down the latest market action is New York Life Investments economist and portfolio strategist Lauren Goodwin. Lauren, thank you for being here. We talked earlier in the show to Liz Ann Saunders, who talked about that maybe 100 basis points isn't happening, but maybe we'll get more 75 basis point rate hikes, for example. How are you changing or not? your outlook for rates based on what happened yesterday? 
Well, I agree with that perspective. I think we see clear evidence that inflation is nowhere near where the Fed would want it to be or even trending in that direction. I agree that 75 basis points is more likely for next week. It's plenty in, in one move, but risk is to the upside. Now, where I think the major changes that the market was pricing in yesterday, which I agree with as well, were for the November meeting, now 75 basis points very much in play there, and expecting the Fed to get to a 4% policy rate by the end of this year. Now, for context, at 829 yesterday, morning, right before that inflation report was released, that was an April probability. And so this is a pretty significant change in interest rate expectations, which is why we've seen so much volatility in that 24 hours since then. With the volatility that we have seen over that period of time, I mean, it seems like, as we were talking about even in the break, that the markets got caught flat-footed here. And so for investors out there watching, what is kind of the smartest idea that they can make with their portfolio in a time like this? Well, keep calm is, is probably the, the number one most important thing to keep in mind. But the other is that even though economic risks are rising and even though we're seeing volatility, mostly to the downside yesterday, is that when inflation is this high, some of the traditionally risk off or run for the hills types of investment strategies can be a serious drag on long-term wealth creation, which is what most investors, especially on the retail side, are, are looking for. And so while we are moving more defensively in our portfolios, having just last week mo moved from an overweight equity position to a neutral one, that's still fully invested. And so then within that context, of course, there's we're, we're very targeted and very uh, tactical in, in our portfolios, but staying invested feels very scary right now, and it's it's one of the more important things to keep in mind. To, to go back for just one second to the trajectory and pace of rate increases, um, can you sort of break it down for us? Okay, so let's say they get to 4% by year end instead of next April. What difference does that make sort of in real terms to the economy and the markets? Oh, it's exactly the right question, Julie. And I think just as important as the pace that the Fed is moving and the change in that pace that we're all dissecting these past couple days, just as important is how long they stay at that four or now looking like more likely to be four and a quarter percent terminal policy rate. And the reason that's so important, well, twofold. One is that sticking at a higher terminal policy rate is is. I think more likely than the market expects right now. We're seeing a uh, the market pricing in the probability of rate cuts in the second quarter of next year. I think that might be a little too optimistic unless we see some meaningful decreases in inflation and meaningful cooling in the labor market fast. So what does that mean? It means that there's more pressure on the economy in the medium term. But on the investment side, that's a really interesting opportunity for fixed income. If you have some stability from the Fed at yields and that savers haven't seen in a really long time, uh, there's some really interesting opportunities for entry across fixed income at that time. We'd also seen, you know, for all of the different categories that we were evaluating in, in yesterday's CPI print, it, it also comes back to, with a rising rate environment, where that's going to impact people's ability to buy homes. You, you, we saw in the home buyers uh, data this morning, bids are coming down um, year over year at least. And so with all of that in mind, what other parts of the economy are going to see kind of longer term implications of a rising rate environment right now? And, and what does the average consumer need to know? Everyday consumer who might be looking at anything from groceries all the way to potentially buying a home. Well, for home buyers in particular, um, one potential area of comfort, although not immediately, is this is a leading indicator of what's happening in the economy. It's one of the most rate sensitive sectors of the economy. We tend to see housing lead us into a recession, but also lead us out. Mm. We've already seen a lot of the pain in the housing sector. Doesn't mean there's no pain to come, but just to say that that's early. What tends to come next? Um, well, we start to see next margin compression. We're already there. And then earnings revisions in the economy. Now, that's really important for equity investors, but for everyday people, it's also important because that's when you're going to start to see uh, layoffs, potentially, when companies are seeing their earnings fall. Um, and so that's where then, of course, the, the average household, household looking at potentially up to 3 million jobs over the course of the next several months, more likely to be lost as the economy slows. Today's CPI report showed rents rose 0.7% in August from July and marking the fastest monthly gain since January 1991 annual rate inflation rising 6.7%, that the highest rate in almost 40 years. Let's talk more about rents 
and the housing sector with Lawrence Yoon, the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist, Senior Vice President of Research. Lawrence, nice to see you. How big a problem is that dramatic surge in rent for the housing sector, for the Fed, and for inflation? Uh, well, uh, you know, we had had housing shortage uh, before the pandemic, and then housing shortage uh, get worsened uh, during the pandemic as people uh, went rampant in terms of purchasing uh, properties. But with the sharp rise in mortgage rate from beginning of this year, uh, we have seen home sales come down. But what that means is that people who want to uh, purchase a home, they can no longer purchase. So now they are becoming renters. So the rental demand has been rising from a sharp rise in mortgage rate, along with continuing job creation. So I think that we have several additional months of further rise in rents. So then given obviously now the difference in purchasing power with inflation still being so persistent, what does this mean regionally? Because obviously it's, it's not a monolith when you look at the, the real estate sector and how it's performing across the country. What are you seeing regionally? Uh, well, you know, regionally, uh, the Midwest market is the most affordable. So someone who has the flexibility to move, uh, the Midwest offers uh, buying a decent sized home at affordable prices. Uh, the southern states, especially Florida, is still super hot. Rents are rising very fast. Home prices are rising. Uh, even with the reduction in home sales, prices continue to rise. I would say the West region, California, uh, possibly Portland and Seattle, there may be some price reduction, minor reduction. Some people may take a chance at trying to grab those uh, falling prices. Uh, but overall, across the country, in nearly every market, prices are higher now compared to one year ago. Lawrence, you said it was likely that rents are going to continue to rise. How much, I guess, how big of a jump could we potentially see? I think uh, it will probably top out at seven or eight uh, percent. Today's number was six percent annual gain. Uh, so the uh, given the housing shortage, uh, this rent growth will rise. But good news is that the builders are putting up more apartment buildings, highest apartment building activity in over 40 years, and that will begin to bring more supply. But it takes time. It's not an overnight uh, thing that we have more apartments. Uh, the construction activity, trying to get those bricks, lumber in line, uh, it's going to take some time. Yeah, we are going to have back-to-back -back years of 400,000 plus units built. That's the first time since the 70s we've seen that. But the Gen Z rent increase is a staggering one, Lauren. 16% increase among Gen Z. I'm curious what you think the impact will be of all this on mortgage rates already up to 589 as we continue to raise rates. How high will the 30 year fix go? Uh, you know, anytime there, there is a more spending into the economy, uh, you know, people's wages are rising at five, six percent, which is a very good increase. But all that is being wiped away by rising rents and rising consumer price inflation. Now, uh, that is a very difficult challenge because it means that people, Gen Z, particularly, they are unable to save up for down payment, which is required uh, to be a successful homeowner. Uh, so that is putting a great burden. So the solution to it all is more supply. Now, if we have more supply, whether it is product, clothes, uh, television set, but also more home, it will lessen inflation pressure. So we need to increase supply because demand is already high. We just need to get more supply to lessen the inflationary pressure. And Lawrence, we have seen some people, some sellers reducing their prices in order to sell things, not you know, obviously staying a little bit longer on the market than they used to. But is it still going to be a seller's market for the foreseeable future? Uh, now it's moving towards more balanced market. Uh, so for buyers who got outbid, multiple offers being widely present last year, uh, they may want to give it a second try because there are far fewer buyers in the market and certainly more choices. And then uh, get those contingencies, home inspection, appraisal contingencies, because you don't want to waive it because waiving it means taking a chance. Uh, so much better chance for the buyers to consider better negotiation on contingencies, as well as even price negotiation. All right, so certainly tipping the scales a little bit there. A big thank you there. Well, let's continue the inflation conversation here, but more specifically, taking a look at food prices. Americans can still expect to pay up on their next trip to the grocery store. 
As groceries continue to outpace overall inflation, prices are now seeing their fastest rise since 1979. Here to break it all down is Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma. Brooke, what are we looking at? That's right, Akika. We keep going back to that 1979 year, of course, for the overall food category, up 11.4 percent. That's the highest increase since May of 1979. But for groceries specifically, up 13.5 percent. That's the highest increase since March of 1979. So each month, it seems like it's beating that more than 40 year high. Of course, from July to August, the cost of gross groceries increased 0.7% month over month. That's lower than recent months, but still not as low as where we were back in December of 2021, only up 0.4%. Kiko, I say only up, but still, that's higher than the month prior. Now, cereal, this category is impacted by disruptions in grain markets due to the Ukraine war, whereas dairy and related products, keep in mind here that it's heightened cost of cattle, animal feed, and farm labor that's really taking a toll. In addition to that, when I spoke to Steve Reed, he an economist at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. He told Yahoo Finance that higher prices were in part due to the cost of transportation. Of course, seeing a bit of relief here. Energy costs decreased by 5% compared to July 2020. Month over month, gasoline down 10.6%, making it a bit cheaper to transport goods. But still, consumers can expect sicker shock when they head to the grocery store next time. Yeah, and Brooke, we just showed that graphic there. I mean, green arrows across the board here. What specifically is driving some of these prices higher? Yeah, well, take a look at that. Eggs up 39.8%. This was always a volatile market, but more specifically, it's been a bit more uh, higher in price over the course of the pandemic. Now, if you take a look at milk, that's up 17%. Like I said before, it costs farmers more to feed the cows and also to, to have labor on their farm. Coffee, I want to take a look Look at that. Of course, Akiko, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Starbucks by Annual Investor Day happening today. That's up 17.6% year over year, down 1% month over month, but still something to keep look to keep a lookout for, especially when these companies look to recover from the impact of the pandemic and as consumers really head out and make their way to the store. Yeah, 40% hike in eggs, certainly a steep price to pay there. Brooke De Palma, as always, thanks so much for that. Let's bring in our very own Jerry Blickery, who's tracking all of the market action for us this morning. A lot of big movers this morning, Jared. That's right. Uh, the big question is, is this another day that is the beginning of an entire week of downdrafts? And that would be because the market is repricing what it did not know previously, that CPI is a little bit higher than thought. Now, here are the NASDAQ 100 futures. want to show you the futures so we can see this big drop at 8.30 a.m. 4% is a huge day here. And as I've been saying, when you take a look inside this report, um, the August numbers may be hiding a little bit of stealth inflation that is still bubbling up to the surface. That is, when you take out food and energy, we're still looking at a core number of 6.3%, very elevated. Here's the NASDAQ 100. Not surprisingly, the mega caps are suffering immensely. Meta is down 7.5%, NVIDIA close behind it. Amazon down 5, Apple down over 3, Microsoft Alphabet down more than 4. You take a look at the sector action, and not surprisingly, it is a mega cap sectors that are all down more than 3.5% right here. Energy, the least dirty shirt in the laundry basket, that is in the upper left, that is down over 1%, and it just gets worse from there. So utility staples also kind of in the lead there. I want to show you, it's not all bad news. Uh, we have not given back all of the gains that we've had over the trailing week. That would be five days. You can see materials and consumer discretionary there still posting some gains. But I do want to take a look, uh, step back here. This is the S&P 500. This is a two-month chart. I was talking about giving back some of those four days of gains, those four big green candles half of that is now gone and we've seen the market respond to these uh, respond to these events before you take a look at the year to date well here is one day that was one repricing and then it took another big two down days to get near where that terminal was so bottom line if we end up in the green somehow today doesn't seem very likely uh, that would be a huge risk on bull move uh, I would say the same thing happens if we end this week in the green uh, we do have options expiration that is coming on Friday and uh, that could uh, kind of mess with some things as well, as we do not have a lot of liquidity in the market. Finally, the bond market, got to show you this, 13-week T-bill yield, that is on the very short end of the curve, that is up 12 basis points to the highest. I'm going to show you a max chart since 2007, have to go back to the global financial crisis, and that one was when it was coming down. You can see it was coming up about 2005. 
from the opposite direction. Here's the U.S. dollar index. That is stronger at two decade highs as well. And I would be re remiss if not going to Bitcoin. This is a max chart. Just want to show you a year to date. We are still consolidating at these lower levels, but we did see a big move downward in Bitcoin on the report. So nothing kind of spared here as we see it is generally risk off today.